Uh, uh, hello, hello everybody, how's it going? Welcome to the Roundtable Live run by me, Mathis, for today, uh, whatever today is, the 5th of February. How's it going, everybody? Hello. Welcome, hey, Mouth. We got Mouth. Flawless intro. It was pretty close. Mathis. It wasn't bad. <laughs> it wasn't bad. I forgot to, like, unmute Skype for a split second, so I was a little bit... Okay. A little bit nervous, yeah. So if there's any, uh, you know, kinks in the work, you can just blame me. It's it's my fault, but we're, we're working on it here. We're working on it. Oh, look at all the mouths in chat. Everybody's super pumped. That's exciting. You know why they're pumped? It's because Mouth is with us. I mean, yeah. it is exciting. He was the first one to answer the call, so he's more professional than the rest of I'm, us. I'm an eager beaver. You know, That's I true. don't like to be late for appointments, so. <laughs> Whatever. It doesn't make you more professional to be 45 minutes early. That does make you way more professional. If, if, if I had does. a meeting with like a CEO when you showed up 45 minutes early, I'd be like, this guy doesn't have enough to do. 45 yeah. minutes early, a coffee and some donuts for him, and you've got yourself the job, basically. Well, no, some... that, that, that's when you interview for like an entry level data entry position at a at a temp agency. Yeah, well, whatever. He's bringing donuts to that job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing donuts to every job. Anyway, uh, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about today, including but not limited to The Witness, as Nick and Malf have played quite a bit of it. I believe Ryan has played a little bit as well. The new Tomb Raider is now out on PC. A couple of new game announcements, including God of Wars and Xenonauts 2. Uh, we've got Insomniac's new game, but I think we're just going to start with the obvious XCOM 2. It's out officially today. Uh, I've already put a ton of time into it. I know Ryan has had the game for a while now. I don't know if the other two have played much of it, but uh, I'm, I'm eager to get like down and dirty with that game a little bit more. Um, but Ryan, you've got the most experience, so and you just beat XCOM 1, so comparing the two... <laughs> well, <laughs> I beat, just, I just classic Iron Man mode I beat just it. beat it on classic, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've been playing, like, I have a lot of time in XCOM 2, and I don't know, because it keeps get, they keep resetting the build. So I had, like, a preview build that I probably put, like, six or eight hours into, and then I've got this review build, which now is going to update the retail. Mm -hmm. um, apparently I have 16 hours in it, so... Uh, but that is all over, like, the first three months of the game. As is kind of common for me when I play XCOM, I, I like to get, like, a perfect start so that I feel like I'm set off nicely. And, like, this new campaign sort of feels like it, but, uh, I, I really don't know much more than anybody else. Like, if you played, if you mainline the game from last night, you're probably a little bit further ahead of where I've ever been in, in XCOM 2, which is exciting. Yeah, I've put... Mm, only like two hours into it today and i'm playing on what i assume is like classic it's like the third hardest difficulty yeah, yeah um what i didn't like is that you actually cannot you cannot enable iron man unless you skip the tutorial and if right. you skip the tutorial you miss out on like a ton of story stuff uh, you should do the tutorial the first yeah, time. yeah i agree um but i've i've realized uh, maybe i'm just bad but it feels harder than xcom 1 yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think that, I mean, Jake Solomon, he was the lead designer or director or whatever, on uh, XCOM 2 said that even for people who had played, like, classic Iron Man, probably they should play the normal difficulty for their first mode. And I, I agree with that. Like, on the second or third mission, they start throwing enemies at you that take two hits to kill. Yeah. No matter what you do. And they do, like, mind control. And they, uh, like, can panic your soldiers as well. So it, it seems like a lot harder. And, you know, concealment is good. That allows you to, like, set an ambush. But uh, I'm still kind of working my way around trying to figure out what's the uh, what's the ideal way to handle it. Would, that, would you... Yeah, I was going to ask, in terms of the difficulty, though, um, I haven't played <laughs> XCOM 2 yet. But um, is it kind of like the bar is higher? Or is there, you know, cases of extreme, like, RNG just really screwing you over? Have you found anything like that yet? Or is it just more of a constant difficulty, I guess? RNG will screw you over in XCOM, but it feels like the the ceiling has gotten like higher as yeah. well. Because like the start of XCOM Enemy Within is really hard. Like the first mm -hmm. two or three months are really really difficult, especially when Thin Man starts showing up. But if you one sh if you shoot an enemy and hit them, you kill them basically. Like Sectoids yeah. usually die in one hit. Thin Men usually die in one hit, even with basic weapons. Almost everything on classic difficulty, the equivalent of classic in XCOM 2, takes two hits, yeah. which is. Uh, it's troublesome for sure. You really have to rely on like better positioning and and stuff like that. Like I, I think it's a little bit more ruthless. And the strategy layer, like I have no idea what's going on. So I'm just I'm I'm trying to make my way in the dark on it. I think like if you definitely have not played much Enemy Within, there's no shame in like starting on normal difficulty. No. For sure. I I mean I've only played the tutorial mission and then the first mission that you get you go like uh, hunting a power converter or something, which I assume is like going to power my base. And it labeled that mission as easy. So I was like, all right, this shouldn't be, like, you know, it's going to be, like, your first mission. This is going to be no big deal. 
you you see it, you have like eight turns to get to it and hack it and uh, kill all the enemies uh, around, which you could take the whole, uh, however long you want. And you can see like an advent officer and like two advent soldiers. And I'm like, all right, no big deal. I'll set up an ambush. Uh, the advent officer has like eight health. He takes like two or three hits if you want to take him down. Took him out, no problem. I was like, all right, cool. We're going to go hack. We're going to get out. That was easy. I move forward to hack it. And all of a sudden I pop a pod that has an officer, a soldier, and uh, the new the new sectopods, like the big tall sectopod dudes. And he immediately raises a zombie, and then on his next turn, mind controls somebody, and I, I almost lost the whole mission because I did not expect mind control and a zombie mission one that was labeled easy after I already killed some people. Uh, and the way the level was laid out, I don't know if the first mission's randomized, but there's like fires in some inopportune areas that forced me to like go into like more open zones. Um, and it almost kicked my... I almost lost somebody. Nick, Nick's the only soldier that came out of my character pool, and he killed everybody. He was, he saved my whole my whole uh, squad. Yeah, sectoids. Sorry, not sectopods. It's a big difference. It is hey, a huge difference. I want to ask, if you're on the outside looking in right here, and you don't really know what's going on with XCOM 2, why would you want XCOM 2? Especially, what's different? What's, what's new? What's changed about it? Especially considering... Um, for me, the biggest reason I haven't gotten it is because it costs uh, eighty dollars Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a hard pill to swallow when yeah. I've already spent you know eighty dollars a couple times on like Tomb Raider and a few other games. So. Yeah. Well, if you um, if you like XCOM Enemy Within, then it's kind of like an automatic endorsement, I'd say. Um, apart from that, it's hard to say. Like maybe it's not an impulse purchase, but it is. Uh, it it kind of strikes me as like a 3D Darkest Dungeon is an interesting way to to put it that is a, a reasonable facsimile. Like it, it, XCOM is basically XCOM two at least is basically like two or three games wrapped up in one. You have yeah. like the tactical like Fire Emblem stuff layer, and then you have the base defense where not base defense but base building stuff, and then you have the strategy layer as well, which is like another layer on top of that. So like it's a very complicated game with a lot of systems that interlock and they're all handled really well. Um, definitely do not get it if you absolutely hate games that are decided by <laughs> RNG, because that is what XCOM is. There will be times when you play ideally, and you put yourself in a par uh, terrible position that basically ruins your whole campaign, which yeah. is why I'm not playing uh, on Iron Man. I'm playing on what the, what the community is colloquially referred to as Bronze Man. Where yeah, that's what I'm you, doing too. You should play you... on Green Man. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a little cheaper, yeah, but... Uh, on on Bronze Man, which is just informal, you uh, you turn Iron Man off, but you only reload if you like if it'll Lost. ruin your campaign. Yeah, it's yeah basically exactly. Over. So I, I think that seems fair uh, to start with. But yeah, if you're if you're the kind of person who would like, you know, get ten hours into something and then lose it and be like, shit, like this feels really frustrating, then that's probably not for you. But uh, it's really rewarding. I mean, I have like a hundred and. 179 hours in XCOM Enemy Within, and uh, probably like at least 20 or 30 in the iPad version as well. So I'd, I'd really recommend the series for sure. Uh, Are the main bullet points mostly just the new procedural levels, or is there? I mean, like story yeah, the new... that's really worth getting into. So the, for the me, the story is cool because it's like this whole idea of like now you're the attacker. Like so, the right. canon ending to XCOM One is uh, the aliens one they took over the game takes place 20 years later and now you're fighting this like and instigating this guerrilla warfare against basically the rulers of earth at this point mm -hmm. um if you're coming from xcom one i guess the gameplay differences are there's a lot of quality of life stuff that just was missing from xcom one that is now part of xcom two uh graphically it's not hugely different like the style is still there but though it's a sharper cleaner looking game um the missions they're constantly trying to from what I've seen and what I've played, there's a lot more urgency to all your missions. There's almost Say always, yeah, yeah, there's almost always something you're trying to get to. Um, and the addition, and, and a lot of the XCOM 1 was you're very much attacking in one direction, right? The enemies are there, you start here, you're pushing forward until you wipe out all the enemies. Now, uh, like, enemies can call for backup and they can land behind you and cause this chaos that really wasn't available or really didn't happen in XCOM 1. Um... The classes are pretty notably different. There's a few similar things, like Sniper is basically the same. Um, but, I mean, you're really... Like, if you hated the, the reboot of XCOM in 2012, you're not gonna love XCOM 2. But if you yeah, loved it, like, I think you're gonna love this even more. XCOM 2, it seems like it's 
if the easiest way to recommend it is if you have experience with Enemy Within, because I think people who like Enemy Within will be like, oh, now when you move to a spot, it tells you if you'll be able to have line of sight on an alien, or mm -hmm. you know, like um, there's like triple the enemies, or you don't always start in the same continent. You know, you have to like that's procedural, procedural level, so you're not constantly doing like the same outdoor map or yeah. you know convenience store and stuff like that. If you've never played Enemy Within, I guess it's kind of hard to explain why you should jump in there. The other thing but, is like. Uh, weapon customization is a big thing now too like you can oh, yeah, make there's loot there yeah. you go there's loot in the game you can build custom weapons so like say nick you're you're my grenadier now in like my game and i, I get all this cool stuff to like increase your clip size and, and shot distance and all this other stuff and damage done and i make this awesome gun that's perfect for grenadier and you're my best one i'm gonna give that to you which gives you more like value to me as a player so if you die i mean obviously it's gonna be more heartbreaking but so there's that the weapon and hand it to somebody else but it's going to be an investment, like, that's just... It gives you more of an emotional investment within Wait, your Do character. I have to have certain skills to use certain weapons? So if no. I die, the weapon won't be compatible with someone else. Yeah, else's. like, can't you take the weapon and give it to somebody once Nick is Well, is you dead? can't give, like, a... Every class has, like, a unique weapon. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can't give, like, grenade well. launcher to a sniper. Because the, the yeah. loot dies but... with the character, is what you're saying? I actually... I, I don't know about that. I actually have I would, no idea, you're right. What I, I would thought... say about it is that it's a pretty minor thing... Like if you, you're you're gonna be more concerned about the loss of the mission and the loss of the soldier than a mm -hmm. gun. It's not yeah. like losing like a legendary weapon in an right. RPG or oh, okay. something. It just adds another layer, and the loot is randomly dropped from from enemies. And there's a lot of like, do I? The loot only stays on the ground for like X number of turns. So do you risk it to go grab the loot, or do you hold back and just like pray that it works out in your favor? Mm -hmm. uh, and the other aspect that I like um, that I know we were just talking about off camera was like there's this new character pool option. So when you boot up the game. Right before you even start a new game, you can go into the character pool and you can just create custom characters. Uh, they can have, like, you know, obvious custom facial features, patterns, names, all this other stuff. Um, and one of the cool things I really like about it is you can di dictate whether they're going to show up in your game as recruits, uh, as VIPs, or as dark VIPs. You can also specify whether you want them to be, like, a special class. So if you, if you complete this mission and you rescue this person, like, this amazing sniper, it might be, like, Ryan that I dictated that I want him to be a sniper yeah. in my game. <laughs> um, but nice. you can do, like, recruit VIP and dark VIP. So uh, for Ryan, as an example, I, I had him so he could either show up as a recruit or a dark VIP in my game. Dark VIP is, like, an assassination mission. You're working with the aliens. There's a special mission to go kill Ryan uh that is now like the game is pulled from the pool and put him in the game Bring it on yeah <laughs> and then there's vips that you go rescue them and they're like really good scientists or engineers that you go rescue them now they're part of your base and they're giving you extra bonuses or they just show up as soldiers that you can just add into your army uh and as i've said i was saying on twitter i said off camera like ryan is someone who can show up as a recruit or a dark vip and had kate show up that she can only be a recruit so on the off chance ryan shows up as a dark vip i'll take kate to go kill her husband it'll be this tragedy that people will love and uh, cherish. Yeah, I, I do like that feature of the the character pool too, because um, I, I I think it'll be a lot more frustrating too with the whole you know once your character dies, it dies. It's not only like have you built up this character; it's a character like you've basically given birth to it, right? right. It's like your little baby. So I feel like that's really gonna bite a lot of people in the ass later. But that's kind of what keeps you coming back to certain games like similar to darkest dungeon right you know your character dies and you're like oh like this sucks yeah. so bad like <laughs> I, I was like a level five or level six character but then it just kind of like drives you to create a new game or just like to mm -hmm. to get another one going oh, it's it's an interesting dynamic for sure i know in the in xcom 2 too if like if you leave a soldier behind there's a chance that there's a mission that comes up to rescue that soldier yeah i've heard that too yeah so like if you like I had to get out. I had to leave one of, like, Nick behind. Maybe, like, in two weeks, there'll be a mission be like, we've located him. Like, go re you can go rescue him right now. I'm not going to be alive in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, like, that, I think that stuff, like, more investing of, like, the attachment to your soldiers and stuff, uh, as well as uh, some gameplay, like, tweaks and stuff have been great. Now, I have heard, though, and I will attest to that the performance of the game is not exactly uh, stable. Really? Like, it's it feels not optimized and there's like huge reports of the game crashing on medium to low range pcs constantly uh just doesn't feel like completely worked out i haven't run into i've the only thing i've run into is like the frame rate will once in a while dip 
kind of out of nowhere, and then it'll be I back. I thought that was like because I had it on not my solid state drive, but maybe no. it's just a it's a game issue. It's a game. It's a it's a widespread like game issue. Even on like, and I have a pretty big like a beast rig, as I'm sure most of us do. Uh, it's still kind of being it's it's being a little finicky from time to time. It's the same engine, right? No, uh, no. it it is. I'm trying to think because I've seen the splash screen when you boot it up so many times. It's on the rad engine still, I think. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think that it's just like the harness that is. Let me put it this way: it it looks a lot better. It does. Than oh, okay. Enemy within, like enemy enemy within, only needed like a little bit of uh, unpolish to make it run on the iPad. Like on the yeah, iPad, it looks almost the same as PC. XCOM Two looks like it looks good, but um, I I don't know anything about the optimization. But I have heard that you know the the port is not necessary. Well, not port, but the the PC is not necessarily fantastic. It's only PC, isn't it? That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't do console release this time around, which is which a little I, weird. You no, know, is I think it's sensible. I imagine that the XCOM community on PC probably drove like eighty five or ninety percent of the sales for it. That, it was that out on sense. 360, but I, I can't imagine playing XCOM on a controller. My friend like, played I, through the whole game on the 360. I was like, more power to you, buddy. Like, that's it, insane. It, it, like, if you can, that's fine. But, like, I uh, I have enough trouble on the touchpad where I can, like, accidentally click the wrong button. Like, I almost bought the 360 version back when I actually rendered videos because I was like, I could render XCOM and play XCOM at the same time. <laughs> that, like, I, I don't know if I it's necessarily... an addiction, I guess. It now. Uh, yeah, you, you can get pretty obsessed with the game, but well, that's fun though. That's what what's so good about it. As XCOM two, yeah, it's really good. I would say uh, check it out if you really liked the reboot in twenty twelve. It's it's really really good. Uh, but moving on from XCOM, the big thing that was announced. So I went to Pack South, and there was like a game announcement at Pack South, which is really weird. Insomniac's new game, Song of the Deep, was announced. Uh, but the big thing, outside of it being like a Metroidvania style, like underwater exploration game, is that it's being published by GameStop. Whoa! Yeah, that's like a and first? they announced it at PAX. That's and they very announced not it at PAX. It was weird. It wasn't even on the show floor. So like, you go into the convention center, and then there's like this little like uh, hall or like room before the show floor before you have to walk through the archways, and that's where it was. So Song of the Deep was in that room, and then you go through the archways where they check your badge, and that was the show floor. So they were standing on the outside of it. Um, I don't know much about it. I just, I found it interesting. Like, I'm, I'll pop up on the website again because they haven't really talked too much about it. But the fact that it's being published by GameStop is bizarre. Well, here, the Especially, key, oh, sorry, go ahead, Fox. I was just going to say the key feature of the, of the game I've got up here. You can pre-order um, it now. Yeah, of course you, you can. can. So the key features explore a fantastic non-linear interactive underwater world from ruins to boneyards to gardens. Um... Upgrade your submarine with new abilities to access new areas of the sea and combine your abilities in surprising ways like catching a torpedo with your claw arm. <laughs> uh, out outmaneuver and battle. I like that. That's the feature that's I like how happy it made you when you said it. <laughs> um, you get to battle creatures along the way from lantern jellies uh, and giant, giant bosses. Oh, yeah, relax. And experience an unforgettable journey a powerful tale of your daughter defying impossible odds to search for her father so you know this sounds to me like an underwater version of insanely twisted shadow planet which i yeah, really never loved, played actually i never played it. game that game yeah. was one of my favorite metroidvanias i highly it even it. has like the same style of logo i feel <laughs> like yeah yeah the, that's true the lo it's like a like a cthulian monster it's sort of like giant squid thing yeah, i guess i kind of see it I'm, I'm watching the trailer right now i don't know if the trailer's on the screen uh, and no, because I didn't have time to set up the screen. Fa fair that. enough. That'll be next uh, time. You, you can find the trailer yourself. Uh, I, Here, I'll link it. I like a lot of in Insomniac stuff, actually, um, despite having not played much recently, at least. Like, I didn't play Sunset Overdrive. That was, like, yeah, that was Xbox I like Spyro, one. you know, Spyro. way back in the day. Infamous. <laughs> They're infamous. a reputable studio is what you're trying to say, I think. Everybody seems to like them Insomniac somewhat. makes Infamous? Didn't they? Isn't that Insomniac, or am I just crazy? I thought mm. it was. Wait. No, it infamous. says in their footer. Look, so the Disruptor, yeah, that's what I was looking Pyro, at. Ratchet and Clank, Resistance, no, Fuse. No, Infamous is Sucker Punch. Oh. That's what oh, yeah. oh, so they've done Resist. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, turn the bottom. Sunset. Ratchet like, and Clank. Why the heck are these guys, they're making an Xbox One exclusive and a PS4 exclusive. It's, uh, but uh, I'm watching the trailer here, and I'm like, I kind of think it looks like if it didn't have the Insomniac label behind it, mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't looks... you look at this and be like, this looks like kind of a generic indie game a little bit yeah 
I'm getting from what worms, I've seen. Worms vibe. Yeah, that weird clay-ish looking yeah. kind of graphic style. I'd be curious because, so it's going to be PC, Xbox One, and PS4. I mean, really the thing that, when I, I mean, the game doesn't look that remarkable right now, but honestly, like, GameStop publishing it, I'm wondering if, like, because GameStop obviously has been struggling, not, not hugely, but, like, you right, know, yeah. the digital era taking over. I wonder if this is going to be, like, their next step to trying to remain profitable is, is publishing games, maybe not super expensive games, but by developers to keep themselves, I mean, I feel like saying keeping themselves afloat is a bit, you know, I dramatic, mean... but... The real question is, I think, going to be whether it's, like, too late for them to get in the game. I mean, they are a big company, but it's pretty evident, like, brick-and-mortar stores are becoming less and less common. Yeah. I mean, you look at what Amazon, for instance, has done to a lot of these these smaller shops. It's like, it's so easy. Yeah. People sometimes, you know, it's like, well, I like to look at the product, at least. I My parents... As, a, as an example, they'll go to a store just to be like, ah, I like this <laughs> product, and then they'll go home, go on Amazon, you oh, know, yeah. buy it, have it yeah, delivered, yeah. and stuff like that. There'll and be tons of times where I'm in the store, and I'll just whip out my phone and be like, is it on Amazon for cheaper? I could save, like, 10 bucks. Yeah. All right, I'll just yeah. do that. So for, like, games <laughs> in particular, it's not, like, there's no real need to go and look at the, the case, right? Like, that's not usually going to factor into you buying something. So I think if they want to, this is pretty much the evolution of them. Dude, GameStop had some really weird ideas about how they wanted to handle this transition to the digital era. They actually really wanted people for a while to come into the store to buy DLC and get receipts with codes printed yes, out on yes. them. So they could interact with employees who would then try to upsell them on a hundred other things and get their edge card. Mm-hmm. I'm not making this up. It just I can't imagine on any level where that makes sense other than if you're in weird corporate la-la land. So I don't know how that maps to further down the road, but it seems like a bad omen if that's where you're starting. To then go in I that direction. I feel like direction. that's been a thing they've been wanting to do for years. I'm like selling like digital codes for just not even just DLC, but like Steam games and all this other stuff. When it's like it's a manufacturer's suggested retail price that they don't go like lower than. Hmm. You're like, why would why would I go to a brick and mortar store? If it was like a mom and pop store where it was like I've been running this since like 1985, then you'd be like, okay, that's cool. There's like some culture there, but mm-hmm. like if I'm gonna drive 15 minutes, like you know, maybe pay for parking, yeah, go buy a game for the same price at GameStop that it would be on Amazon, I get it immediately, I guess, instead of waiting a day, yeah, and I have to interact with somebody who's like. Trying to trying to upsell me on stuff and like wants to harvest my personal information. It <laughs> yeah. sounds like it sounds paranoid, but I mean that is part of it. Yeah. You know, Do you have the uh, GameStop rewards card, Ryan? Yeah. You know, it uh, was a... not just the game's fine. <laughs> How about sure a warranty for three dollars? We can yeah. warranty it for one uh, year. You know, I like I'm I'm pretty careful with my games. That's okay. <laughs> like uh, just the game, please is all right. Do you like Game Informer? Um, uh, just the games, like okay. <laughs> I used to actually try to leverage that whole thing against them in a way to make better relationships with people that came into the store because they knew they were there to expect that. So if you try to go out of your way to be like, look, man, I get that this is what goes on in these places. I'm just going to level with you. They respect you so much more and they'll come back for that reason. Yeah. So it's weird that you can use their own shit against them to get better customers. The worst part, I remember going in, uh, you know, after I didn't work there anymore and buying something and be like, oh, I see you're like you're buying fucking like whatever game. First person shooter. Why? Let me open up this book of pre-orders. Let me show you all other first person shooters coming out in the next year. Only five dollars down. I'm like, yes, I want to I want to pre-order every other first person shooter game in existence thank yeah. you uh, it's the, the worst, worst the worst thing that i really don't mind seeing a lot of like game stores close down is you see people they'll buy a game used right because yeah. hey it's like it's a disc whatever as long as it works it works um and then you'll see pictures on the internet like some kid gets home and it's just like a piece of paper printed and glued onto like you yeah. know, a My Little Pony DVD or something like yeah. that. And it's like, God damn it. It's like, I mean, that eats up a good chunk of your time. Like depending on where you live, some people have to drive a half hour into town to, to their local to. EB or, yeah. or whatever it may be. And it's just like... It's... That's the benefit of switching to PC gaming, I think. Like if you have the computer to do it is uh, midnight release stuff you don't have to worry about because everything's going to release on midnight yeah, on Steam. Man. Like, you don't have to worry about, oh, it's got to sell out, got to go to the midnight release. But you get it on Steam at midnight anyway, you don't have to leave your house. Who cares? Yeah. You need to drive 20 minutes, park, wait in a line of people. I'll, and like, I remember for GTA 4, I did the midnight release. And it was just, like, this huge line of people around the building. I was like, this is not fun. 
Some I'm people look at it like this. a party, though. Like, this is a social event. You can come and meet people that you never would have met. So there could be an upside to it if you spin it properly, but you've got to actually... You've got to be the person You're in charge of the event. You're asking me to socialize. To I don't want no, to I know, socialize. but some people want to do that. That's true. I think there is, like... I sort of agree with what Nick's saying, that if, like, a store has culture and mm. i know it sounds like a hipster way to put no, no, it i've been in that but, position i've been in yeah. charge of doing that and yeah. it's actually a thing like i know in the hometown where fox and i grew up they had like chain video stores back in the day you know jumbo video blockbuster stuff like that yeah, yeah. but then downtown there was also classic video which was run by like a dude and his wife and had like a huge selection of like old movies and independent movies and foreign movies and then they, they organized like screenings and stuff like that and you're like yeah i could literally pirate it in 10 seconds <laughs> or i could pay five bucks like support a local business meet some people and like that's cool but like when you, yeah, when you go to gamestop and there's just like a giant cutout of like you know samus or something and you're like yeah. oh, video games yeah, I like <laughs> we them. love that yeah i like video games you know but like uh online it just saves you that hassle yeah yeah the a couple of good points i saw come up in the chat here though is i mean and one i'm thinking of too is um, you know, we're with like Netflix and Steam, we're moving increasingly to everything, you know, through the internet, but there are certainly rural areas that internet speeds are crazy. Like my brother lives yeah. kind of out in the woods. He's got one megabyte or megabit per second download. So Damn. downloading, uh, something like, um, uh, you know, a, well, triple A game, like say Rise of the Tomb Raider, right? That act literally takes him yeah. a couple days. Um, yeah, it could be forty six do... gigs. There are games that big now. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I guess that's where the, they'll end up thriving. Um, for me, like the brick and mortar stuff, I go to now. Like, I'll avoid GameStop, but I'll go to like little like indie mom and pop owned game stores and like buy old retro games. Like that's where I'll go now, uh, just mm -hmm. for collection. But anytime I walk by a GameStop, I'm like, I can't. I don't want. I don't want to deal with like being sold a million things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what is what are the repercussions then if they're publishing this game? Does it mean there's going to be exclusive content? Are they going to try and there favor? Has to be, right. They're going to try and favor distribution through their own stores, you would think. Well, you've seen that before, right? Like, certain yeah. uh, games are like, oh, you get this exclusive character oh, at Target only, absolutely. at Walmart only. So I've seen it a ton. I'm sure they'll do that. Um But what else? But will I mean, they, like, they're going to make, they're gonna make, they're gonna make profit no matter where they sell it. Like, I mean, they're going to make money no matter what. Here's a, I mean, my, my guess for this is just a guess. But, uh... It seems to me like they're not going to put this on a disc. This is not a $60 game. Like, I don't mean that as an insult. But right. no, just but looking just at it, you're like, it. they're not going to sell this for 60 bucks. So Oddly something we talked about last podcast. Yeah. Also true. It could be, um, you know, maybe it's something they have, like, a digital code for at their store. And then they can add it, try to add it as, like, an upsell. They'll be like, you know, for 5 bucks or 10 bucks, you can get this code if you buy another game with it. And then you can put it into Steam or something when you get home. Or maybe they'll have, they might have their own proprietary... Uh, launcher, actually, now that I think about it. Like, that, that might exist already. Yeah, you know? Right, that's think, probably yeah. a thing. There, it, You can download uh, uh, game PC games directly off of GameStop's website, actually, now that I think like, about it. Not through a client, just onto your, onto your hard drive? God, I can't remember if it's through I remember Rob I don't, I think complaining about client. wanting Madden. He could only buy it through GameStop somehow, and he needed some kind of distribution platform for it. You might be right. I mean, also, see. I'm just remembering now, like, this is really going to screw them hard if this really does go to digital also because one of their main ways to upsell people is GPGs, the game guarantees, and if they can't sell guarantees on digital codes, that's like a whole yeah. revenue stream gone. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing, too, I'm thinking of, um, and, I mean, obviously for us it's probably not an issue, uh, but, you know, credit cards and stuff, what, as soon as you get into buying games online, whether it's through Steam or something else, like, a lot of kids just don't have credit cards. I remember yeah. when I first got Xbox Live, uh, or my brother and I both, and we're like, hey, Dad, can we, like, yeah. give you 60 bucks? And yeah. you, like, put your credit card in? He's like, no. It's like, it's not going to, like, it's going to charge you the 60 bucks, and that's it. Like, here's the cash right now. But, I mean, that's a reality for a lot of people, too, if you can't go to a store and get it or at least pay yeah. for a code as a cash. parent wouldn't you not trust your kids even at all now with how shady most people are with credit card policies they might get charged like a hundred times you yeah, don't know I what's mean, gonna happen you look at all the free to or the you know free to play but you know, buy stuff on ios yeah. like every couple months like father got ten thousand dollar bill from a kid from <laughs> clash of clans and you're like all right <laughs> that, that kid now has uh 
four hundred and thirty thousand subscribers on YouTube, though. <laughs> yeah, of he's he making his way. It's an investment. <laughs> he didn't pay back his dad, though. So, <laughs> quick cursory search. So, Song of the Deep is going to be fifteen bucks, fourteen ninety nine. Okay. okay yeah. But May in May nineteenth, twenty fourteen, GameStop dumped their PC game client. Oh. All so right. you'd buy code for Steam Origin and Uplay. So I would assume you're going to be able to buy a code for like Steam or something, unless they're rebooting it. Which well, I mean, possible. if it's coming out on PS4 and, and, Xbox, and One. Xbox One as well, I guess that they're content with putting it on somebody else's uh, platform. I, like, non-cynically, mm -hmm. what this is to me is maybe like a cool opportunity for uh, a large studio to make something a little smaller and maybe try out a, an idea that is not as ambitious and time-consuming and money-consuming as something like Sunset Overdrive 2. Right. Yeah. Uh, but kind of sort of cynically i'm like gamestop <laughs> has done nothing to earn the goodwill of right. consumers so why yeah. give them the benefit of the doubt but i mean I, I guess i do give insomniac the benefit of the doubt at least it could just be a marketing thing i mean there is a lot of uh, store space for potentially for sale in gamestops and that's uh pretty good for getting eyes so maybe that's what they want i have to imagine though like this is a little bit of a stereotype but the people that still primarily shop at gamestop I can't imagine them walking in though. and yeah, seeing like a video of this and being like, "Oh, I gotta have that." No, you're right. probably right, but it could just be a bit of a misstep too. I don't know. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. So, well, uh, I'm definitely a little curious how it's gonna go out. As long as the game is good, I'll end up picking it up. So, but speaking of uh, shady business practices, oh okay, Peter Molyneux oh, has well. <laughs> been in the, the news again recently. First, his uh, Twitter was hacked. Yeah. Uh, somebody faked an announcement of him, or him retiring, which everybody thought was serious, and I don't think we have reason not to. And then he was like, no, we're hacked, it's fine. And then, like, a couple days later, he's like, by the way, here's Goddess Wars on Steam Early Access, which and is, like... this time I wasn't hacked. <laughs> <laughs> and it was live, immediately on Steam Early Access. Uh, I think Malf here has a few words to say about it. Uh, have because... you played Goddess Wars? Not yet. Um, I did, uh, I think I was talking about it before. Um, I got an email about it um, because you know I'm a I was a goddess backer back in the day. I was oh, like, you know what? The beginning of goddess. You know what? Peter? Bring us to the beginning of the goddess promise. The goddess promise was basically, you know, they had this general premise is like bringing back the the god game, right? Um, and you know, Peter in the past has had some success and you know made some good games. Like I was a huge fan of uh, Black and White. Like that's, that's a, a really good guy. Yeah, populous yeah. as well. Um, it's good for that stuff. And so when I saw what he was doing with Goddess, I was like, well, okay, like I'm not, I was not a fan of what you did with Fable and all your broken promises, but at least you're going back to something you kind of have a, you know. a, a good history with that yeah. you know. But it, it pretty quickly became apparent um, through the, the devlog updates and all that stuff that they were really winging it with Goddess. And they implemented some stuff. They got a lot of backlash. You know, the, the you could buy gems and stuff that you could use in game. Like that really drove people crazy. Um, and just like basically changing the premise every other month. So that left a bitter taste in a lot of people's smells, mine included. So um, and then of course you had the controversy with the whole curiosity thing and like the winner not getting paid the money. I don't know if that got resolved, um, but apparently. Um, Brian Henderson, that the person who won, he is now featured in Goddess Wars as uh, one of the opposing deities. So, Sweet. <laughs> congrats! Yeah, we'll the, the God of Gods. <laughs> um, and you know, of course, this is bringing up questions of like, well, what's actually happening with Goddess? Because this is all part of their Goddess universe. I don't. Wasn't this know. this f combat stuff supposed to be in the initial Goddess game, like the actual Goddess game? Not that I know. I mean, I'd have to. I swear that there was supposed to be an I RTS element. Yeah. Well, there is. There's definitely combat in the original one. Like, I I gotta look more closely as to what the difference of Goddess Wars is supposed to be. Like, um, looking at the screenshot, it looks pretty much similar. Like, I, I don't know. And they they just say here, you know, uh, they've responded to the whole "Have you abandoned Goddess" thing, and it's they all they say is not at all. The release of Wars proves that we are still dedicated to Goddess, and even uh, or and everyone who owns or has previously purchased Goddess already has Goddess Wars. Goddess Wars yeah. is free for all previous Goddess Kickstarter backers and owners. So, so it, like Goddess is actually, if you try to buy it on Steam, you can't buy Goddess. You can only buy the pack that has Goddess and Goddess Wars, which is the price of 
got us originally. So right. that was, I remember seeing that and being like, all right, well, I, I feel I, it, it, be, help. it felt like they had like taken a piece of what was supposed to be in the initial game is like, it's a new game. But what's the relevance of changing it like that? I mean, you've got uh -huh. a game that was never finished. Now you're taking something that people generally didn't like and starting another thing on the basis of an, that thing they didn't like from scratch, also in early access. When you got two things that aren't finished now, it's the just... hunch was that it was an opportunity to sweep uh, negative reviews under the rug. Yeah. For God's the same name, like... though, like you rebrand when you do that. I, yeah, Steger, it, like... Steger in chat says the most popular screenshot of Goddess Wars is a Molyneux quote on the intro intro screen that says, "I always envisioned Goddess as two games." Okay. <laughs> of course, he did. Like it's just, I mean, to me. It's just digging their grave deeper and deeper. Yeah. Like uh, it's it's driving, you know, more people to look into this because they're like, well, what's the difference, right? And it's, I don't think it's really gonna change too much. Um, I just I remember I, I remember, <laughs> I'll never forget when it was bef it was either right when the Kickstarter launched or right before he was like talking to uh, it was Adam Sessler interview mm -hmm. and he was like playing Goddess with Peter Molyneux. Mm -hmm. uh, at some convention and he was talking about like the most insane shit because it's supposed to be this huge world with multiple oh, yeah. players yeah. and he was talking about one thing he's like as a god you can move like the pieces of the land around right and like form yeah. the world and maybe you move this one piece of land into the ocean that, are qua that causes this wave and this wave ripples and becomes bigger and bigger by the time it reaches another player it's like a monsoon it's and you destroy <laughs> their land it's because stable. you did this and you move all over again. like yeah. you are so up your own ass dude yeah. <laughs> you need to relax you, you and mouth was like i'm supporting it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i <laughs> will you plant the acorn and then in 50 years yeah no that's the fox story i remember that for right fable there. i was like so pumped but at that point we didn't know like i was I like did. wow the original xbox is really powerful it's really powerful <laughs> and he is just he's the only one that can unlock the true potential of the xbox <laughs> it's just you know as far as i'm concerned you know peter He's on my blacklist. He's number one. He's the only one on my blacklist. I'm still waiting for Milo to come out. I can't wait to talk oh, to this yeah. little kid in my TV. Was that that was like um, for the original Connect? That was the Connect. That was the, the Connect selling point where you're like, this is not, this has nothing to do with it. the the thing that was amazing about the Milo demo was like this kid is an AI that reacts to you and like and has then, an actual conversation with you. Yeah, and then you look at the Connect and you're like, oh, like you can dance and it maps your movements. Like that's. Is the AI that was impressive. You built life. <laughs> I don't, you built life to sell me a camera. Is this the world we live in now? And then they're like, no, the game can't come out. It's not the anywhere didn't... near. That was just an MP4. That <laughs> Peter and the and the MP4 <laughs> collaborated with each other for a couple of days to get the timing right. That's really all it probably was. It, it was, it was just a recording. At the right time and yeah. choreographed the whole exchange. <laughs> God, I remember Milo. I was like, this is incredible. At that point, I for some reason still trusted him after all the Fable yeah. mess ups. It's so a breakthrough in 3D rendering and choreography. I remember showing that video to my mom, and I'm like, Mom, this is incredible. Like, we, I can't wait for the it's connect. It's the future of gaming. <laughs> we keep doing that to ourselves. We freaking push back this, this invisible goalpost of technology saying, like, oh, there's all these amazing things coming down the line. And they're really, like, 20 years down the line. We just keep making up these ideas that they're right here. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, uh, and I remember, like, you could, like, draw a picture and, like, you'd, like, you'd quickly scan it across the connect, and he'd be like, oh, boy. And, like, what you <laughs> I remember that, yeah. yeah I was like, oh, like a incredible. sailboat or something, then he handed it to him, and then he had a sailboat. Dear God, that was just nuts. But, so. Beautiful non-thing. <laughs> gamers want to believe, man. Yeah, we, really we do. But virtual reality is finally a thing, at least, so we have that. Like, we live in a world where virtual reality actually came true. Not Milo, though. I'll never have that virtual son that I've always wanted. You might okay. in 20 years. Maybe. Maybe 10 at this point. I mean, I mean yeah, it's, already. it's getting there. He'll be my virtual reality son. It'll be great. I'll dote him, and then when he gets old, I'll just delete him. Uh, <laughs> don't dote on him. Like, oh. you know, take care of him. Anyway, uh, well, let's move on to a game that did live up to expectations, I think, uh, which would be The Witness. People love The Witness. I like to think of The Witness as kind of like a first-person goddess. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> So I haven't played any of The Witness at all. I, have. I know, Nick, have you beaten it? I've finished it, but, well, okay, I've beaten it, but I have not finished it is the best way to say that. Yeah. All right. And it's uh, a very careful game to talk about again because they didn't want to spoil anything. It's okay. uh, it's very much backloaded for content. The, Everything's the majority like the of the game. game is just staring at mazes, yes, but it isn't just staring at mazes. You will evolve and grow as a person 
through your experiences and i know this sounds really haughty and stupid but it's a great game i really love the witness it's one of the most beautiful games i've ever played <laughs> the whole experience just awed me most of the way through i don't want to talk about the ending but i've still got to unpack a few things didn't fully sink in yet uh, i've I, seen I look forward to finishing 100 percent on it i've watched a couple people play. like i've basically watched dan's gaming play it on twitch for a bit and, like, I've seen some parts where it's just, like, exposition is being, like, quotes are being thrown at you. And I just, I just, I don't understand. Like, I don't know what's going on in the game. The puzzles in the world look beautiful, but I just don't get it. But maybe I just need to play it. You're not meant to get it, and they don't really tell you, like, for hours and hours. What Didn't that... Jonathan Blow say it's, like, the best story he's ever written? Of the I two. I have never heard that. Of, like, the two games he's played. <laughs> like, it's, I, I thought that's something that he said. That he's, like, it's the best story he's ever written. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I feel. I definitely feel like, you know, I'm. I've only got. I'm probably around three hours in or something like that. So not not too deep. Um, but I think it's the 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 type of game, that, you know, his intention is that you you really experience it for yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's that kind of guy though, right? Like he's he's trying to go beyond mainstream formulaic stuff. Um, right. and I think you can really see it in the witness. It's just like it drops you right in there and it's just like all right go there's very little hand holding i mean that well there's no hand holding yeah and like you just like you see you see a beautiful world you see some wires all about and then a few computer monitors or not monitors but you know little yeah, little screens. puzzle monitor screens and um i don't know but that's like that's part of what at least drew me in you know i was sitting there for an hour and i just kind of i had to do a hard stop of like okay don't do another puzzle because like as soon as i did one it's like okay now like let's go for another one let's go for another one yeah right yeah but and i think you know it's, it's probably not for everybody because um, yeah, I agree. some people um definitely you know maybe more towards that instant gratification whereas this game you're not like you're gonna get a puzzle solved maybe in a few minutes and then you're just like okay and nothing has really changed, at least in between, you know, one and two puzzles. Yep. But there will be sets of 20 puzzles sometimes where basically nothing at all does change. You just see the power pass from one monitor to the next. You solve that one, you solve another. And at first, that doesn't seem like a big deal until you realize that's the tone they've set for the last 40 hours. Yeah. Like, you'll go around a corner and then there's, okay, there's 10 more monitors. Let's do these for a while. Okay, that opens a door. Now let's go downstairs. There's 10 more monitors. And eventually you finish it. You get these little moments of like, okay, congratulations. You solved this area. Here's your beacon. And then you're done. You move on to a different area. Those are great. But it does wear you down a little bit after a while when all you do is solve the same kind of thing. But on the other side of it, it teaches you a language and it tutorializes very well. And it does actually sort of build you into this, this new form of speech. Yeah, you learn how to guide a line through a series of blocks in a way that you never thought would be possible. <laughs> Think about What's it this dog? way. You guys have all seen Karate Kid? Yep. Yeah. Ryan, what did you just say? <laughs> I've never seen the Karate Kid. Oh, my wow. gosh. That's so wow. you'll have to find a different movie. No, I see where you're no, going. No, no. <laughs> it's very easy. I mean, you know, um, Mr. Miyagi is, is training him. Um, so he says, it wax come, on, wax off. Yeah, he's like, you know, come, he he's go goes to his uh, his home and he's he's painting the fence and like sanding the deck and painting the house and all this stuff and he's got these different movements, but <laughs> you don't you don't really realize that you know he's painting the fence he's going up and down right, yep. um, painting the house he's going side to side and then waxing the deck he's you know going like this right and in the moment of course he's just like what the hell like i thought i'm training to be like a karate master and here i'm like fixing up this this old man's house he's crazy and then you know the big pivotal moment of like show me paint the fence and and you know all these it comes together so yeah i mean i haven't got there in the witness yet but to me that's that's where it's taking me i'm and kind of that's excited dead on perfect that's a great description of it there at the go. end mr miyagi is jonathan blow when he tells you to climb a mountain <laughs> And so you're going to have seen, a great time. I've seen, I've only played like the first, I don't want to say the first. I've played about two hours myself. I've gotten a beacon and like part of the way towards another beacon. Um, so I'm still very much in the, I'm just solving mazes situation, right? <laughs> mazes are on this screen and I'm figuring out the gimmick and solving them. I've seen late game content, really late game content that I won't spoil. Um, that incorporates other media might be the most, uh, yeah, the, the subtlest. Yeah. And, uh. Sounds so interesting. 
And and I will say that even though watching that, I was kind of like a little bit rolling my eyes, and I'm like, man, this is like super not for me. Like I think if I if I put like yeah. 40 hours into it, and this is not to diminish the work, if I put like 40 hours into it, and then I was watching this video right now <laughs> or this you know piece of media, I would be like, it's kind of up its own butt. But um, <laughs> I respect it because it's such a, a singularly made game. Like, you can tell that this is, like, Jonathan Blow was, like, I want to make this. And then it all feeds towards that. Whereas, you know, it contrasts with something like Tomb Raider, where you're, like, Tomb Raider is a action-adventure game. It's a mostly linear, a little open world. There's crafting elements. There's lootables. You know, there's a lot of story stuff. But then, you know, there's side quests that are relatively inconsequential. It's just kind of, like, all over the place. Like, like too many cooks, although I still think it's very good. Um... This is just like, I respect that this is a, an ambitious, singularly made game, even if maybe it, it doesn't hit me, or, I mean, I can't say that because I haven't gotten that far myself, but secondhand, it doesn't seem like it would hit me that hard, but I'm glad it's like, I'm glad it exists. I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't dare call it pretentious. Like, I wouldn't call it, uh, I, I wouldn't even say it's up its own butt. I would just say, you know, I'm, I'm happy that uh, games like this can exist, because what do we get, like one of these every three or four years or something? Yeah. Yeah. I want to kind of unpack that a little bit more because I actually felt the same way. I kind of did think some of those things you mentioned were a little up their own butts. And they were a little bit sort of uh, like first year philosophy student kind of things. The sentiments were really surface and kind of obvious. And yeah. a lot of people that aren't waiting for a larger context, they might judge them at face value. And I think what this game teaches you is through this language, as you unpack all the rest of the areas of the island, you sort of learn a new way of looking at everything. It's sort of telling you that don't look at these and judge them for what they are because you need to see the whole picture before you can see them. And I haven't even seen it, and I've played it for 50 hours. So it's a, it's a test of your patience and endurance as well as it is about learning. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I can understand why some people would. So I, I don't have any judgment for people that say this game is not for them. Personally, it's like my dream game because I love the exploration element. I think it's absolutely beautiful. There's maybe nothing else I've seen that quite singularly captures an art style as well as The Witness does. Yeah. It's, uh, it goes better than most games than, that try to go for a naturalistic art style. It's just got its own idea, and it nails it. And you are free to take your time. If you get stuck in a puzzle, go to a different area. Uh, you find your own way through the island, and there's stuff that I might never see in it. It's massive. So, like, it, it's, a, it's a project that took him years and years of his life, and I rushed through it in, like, a week and a half. <laughs> And that's so weird to me that I could have gone through that whole thing in that short amount of time and just like so much must be lost on me. So I'm just I'm looking forward to seeing it all in the bigger picture still. Um, for me, like I just will flat out say I'm way too stupid for that kind of game as looking at the puzzles. And I know like I would <laughs> not be able to do it. My brain just cannot work in that way. And I was just I'm impressed with the people who can do it. But I just I I'd like to be good at that game and I think I would enjoy it, but I just can't do it. I would just I wouldn't be able to get past it. It's yeah, it's hard. It's definitely a, a slower paced game. Like for me, like when I play it, it's kind of like when I want to isolate and shut myself off from everything else. It's it's kind of nice actually. You know, when I first got in there and you're looking around, obviously it's very beautiful. It sounds beautiful too. Even like I, I really like the sound of like footsteps and tires on gravel mm -hmm. and stuff. So when you're walking around, it's just like. You know, it's that, and I don't have to worry about some zombies running out of a forest exactly. and killing me. And yes. I can just kind of take sit it back, in. you know, take it in, look at a puzzle, try Very to... Very immersive. It, yeah. it really, it for me, and I, again, this is not for everybody, but, like, it, it calms me down. I just, like it kind of gets me in a different sort of thought process than a lot of games where it's just, like, very fast-paced, and you're like, go, go, go. And, and it's almost, like, a little stressful, not, like, super bad stressful, but this is just, like... I don't know, I think for some people it's 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 it can be good. But I bet again, it would be great on like the Oculus Rift. Ooh. I absolutely hope to play it in that, yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming it's something weird to time for me also. I was playing it for like ten hours at a time and I didn't realize that much time had passed. Very few games can do that nowadays. I can't it, I can't it's lose. So, time it's like to low it. impact, right? Like right. you can just sort of walk away at any point and be like, Alright, I'm just not gonna do that for now. So if you get too stressed <laughs> out, like it's it's only you that's to blame for that, but I tried to persevere when I got stuck most of the time did you guys play uh, chat's bringing it up a bunch and i actually really liked it was the um, antechamber yeah people saying it reminds one of my favorites actually yeah and people saying it reminds them of antechamber i remember playing antechamber but the thing is it wasn't like 
And the chamber wasn't just like one type of puzzle. It was like a bunch of different kinds of puzzles that were all perspective based yeah. and stuff. It, would you would you equate it to like is it like antechamber in 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 regards to what it's trying to do? The scope of antechamber and the breadth of the puzzles is much larger than the witness, whereas the witness really dials in on one concept and goes in a bunch of different directions in that concept. Gotcha. The witness is uh, less about challenging your perception of the whole world as much as it is your perception of those puzzles. Gotcha. Whereas okay. antechamber is all over the place, and I love both of them for both of those reasons. It's much more surreal as well, antechamber. Yeah, and I remember Anti Chamber being more like really, really trippy to play, but I'll never touch the Witness. I just, I, it's, it looks like it's a great game that does what it does incredibly well. I just, I can't. My brain just can't do it. So, well, that's that. We will. Uh, I've got no sweet next segue into the next topic. Uh, but we'll, we'll just tackle the next big game that kind of came out is uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Next big game that came out on PC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rise of the Tomb Raider is really good. <laughs> There you go. Ryan's I've ready been, to talk about it. in a week to talk about Rise of the Tomb Raider. <laughs> well, you were like, what, we're going to talk about R-O-T-R-R, and I was like, or R-O-T-T-R or whatever. I was like, what are you? I don't you're like, what's Rise that? of the Triad. I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Rise like, of the Triad, temporal rendition. I haven't like, played Rise of the Tomb Raider. I have a code for it. I got it. I just have not been able to put any time into it yet. I'm, I'm excited to, to play it, though. Hit me, Ryan. How do you like it? Rise of the Tomb Raider is a fantastic game. If you like linear action-adventure games like the Tomb Raider reboot from 2013 or um, another game I equated to a lot is Max Payne 3, then I think you will love Rise of the Tomb Raider. I think it might be my favorite game in that genre in a long time. Uh, if you don't like games like that, you will probably hate it. It is not a not really a sandbox game. Is not really an XCOM kind of mechanics driven game where you can play it, you know, for 200 hours or anything like that. But if you're, if you like that kind of like, you know, thrill ride aspect where you can just kind of like sit down, do some light puzzling that makes you feel smarter than you probably are. So not the witness. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Combat's relatively satisfying and, um, you know, it's, it's really good, is my opinion. It's basically like that genre. Right now, Crystal Dynamics has made, like, their best Tomb Raider game. It's, like, everybody there at the height of their, uh, at the, at the height yeah. of their talents. Like, I if got you that don't, impression as well, actually. Yeah. It, it's, like, it's basically, like, their <clears throat> kind of triumph, I guess. Like, if you don't like, you know, Kendrick Lamar or something like that, no matter how good To Pimp a Butterfly is, you're not gonna like To Pimp a Butterfly. If you don't like games that are Tomb Raider-esque, you're not gonna like this. But if you like it, it's, it's basically I love uh, Uncharted. a masterwork. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's similar to Uncharted. I couldn't say for sure because I, I haven't played Uncharted. Is it but... like Uncharted? I'm assuming. Yeah, like... I've played a bunch. I've played all the Uncharted games, Me and I too. found it to be quite a bit like the second Uncharted. Actually, oh, that's my favorite one. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in. I'm sold. Yeah, it, it I... was. Uh, it was back into that whole like sort of masochistic mindset, though. I mean, I only played three hours of it, but I, I wish they didn't have to just beat the shit out of Lara so much. But I guess that's just part and parcel with the series now. Yeah, I mean, I think they do a little bit less violent yeah, It's stuff. less than the other one, I agree. And it, it was happy for me to not have that moment of she's spastically dying on the spike as much. But it did happen. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm like eight hours in, closing in on the end of the game. Yeah, I'm eight hours in, closing in on the end. And uh, I, like, in terms of that, I, I, I've made fun of Tomb Raider for, like, three years for, like, it just being shit happens to Lara Croft over and over. Like, you know, yeah. she's, like... <laughs> Every time she jumps on something, like, it breaks, and then she climbs to, like, the top of this rickety staircase, and, like, a lightning bolt strikes a cargo plane that crashes <laughs> it's, into the it's tower. It's Goldberg and... machine of suffering for her. Is what it, <laughs> is. it really is. But, um, like, I kind of, I've come to not necessarily respect it, but understand it, in that if you do the main quest stuff, every main quest has a meaningful set piece. And the, okay. the meaningful set piece usually involve her kind of getting injured and stuff. But she going, she's going through shit, basically, every single time. Um, so it, I like that there's, I guess it feels like there's consequences as opposed to just being like, Hey, your main quest story here. Like I was saying to you guys, like, Oh, go get 10 animal skins and then come back. And then I'll be like, Oh, my village is over the hill. You know, <laughs> every main quest mission feels significant because of those set pieces. And it, you know, admittedly in those set pieces, she does spend a lot of time, like breaking her own ankles and like almost drowning and stuff. It's weird because Uncharted does the same thing where Drake goes through hell all the goddamn time. Something's always happening to him. 
but nobody yells at it about that. And I wonder if it's just because like it's Drake references better. it. He's just like he's he understands. He's like this. My life is crap. Like this. It's a parade <laughs> of shit for her. Like every single surface she touches breaks and falls apart. She'll run over this one single bridge, and like everything around her will fall apart. <laughs> Things she's not even touching or interacting with will try and kill her for no reason. Would you say the We're... same for Uncharted though? Like that happens to Drake too. Occasionally yeah. he'll jump across a cliff face, and nothing will happen. Which like is just sort of I guess relief. maybe I I haven't played the new one, but I guess maybe the difference is just like Drake takes it in like in a witty direction and makes a joke about every time something yeah, terrible and the tone happens. Yeah, is to him. super dire for Lara, so yeah. maybe that's why yeah. it stands out more. Like, I'm wondering the if that's the, there. the difference because I like I said I think about uh, all the Uncharted games and he's just like crap, 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 crap. Like this is like he makes fun of the fact that everything terrible happens to him. Where I guess yeah, maybe it's... Right, actually, it is a big part of it. Yeah, and maybe just Laura's just like, my life, oh, it's so sad. Uh, she's not Hoping. really like that. You said that. I haven't, I haven't played it. I'm just taking she a wild stab. She, she doesn't lament that much. She No. She, she just kind of drives the story forward. She's like a, she's a strong, independent woman. Yeah. She's not... No, Drake. Like, when she cracks her knees open, she's not like, <laughs> oh, my knees. She's just like, oh, that sucked. Okay, let's keep going. You know? All right, gotcha. I got the impression that uh, you could break every bone in her body, and if she wanted something, she would still try and keep crawling along the ground to it. Yeah. Which is why I want less shit to happen to her, because she wants what she wants so badly. <laughs> just give her a break. She's, she's more well-written. I mean, the whole game in general, I think, is more well-written than Tomb Raider 2013. Okay. Uh, and the platforming, like the when the game is at its best, is when there's no enemies on the screen, and it's like, okay, here's like an artifact that you have to get to, and it's kind of like mirrors edgy, like it's not, um, like it's all a uniform like texture and color in the environment, so you've got to like divine your own path, like everything has visual cues that are not really subtle about like the the path that you're supposed to take. But when you can kind of chain those together visually, it feels really good. You're like, okay, I do like a sprinting jump off of this. Uh, I'm going to lose my grip, so press X, climb up, then use your grapple axe to like hit Prince this thing that's too far away. Exactly. It's got, like, it's got some good fluidity to that. Like and that that's, game. that's when it's at its best. And like um, the puzzling elements are pretty good as well. I mean, I've only had like two or three mandatory kind of puzzle sections. But I was like, this is not hard enough that i would ever consider using a walkthrough but not easy enough that you're just like oh just shoot this explosive barrel so so what what's the difference between the 2013 one and this one again that you would say is this better is mostly linear it's just it's more linear more than 2013 than I, I, I think, driven, or? yeah I, I just think like a, everything about it is is a step up like the the 2013 game was good but it was a little bit too torture porny in my opinion yeah, and um like it, i don't know the, the mechanics just feel a lot stronger it's three years later. It looks amazing. It's like it looks fantastic. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and it ran just, really well too for me. Anyway, it reminds. Yeah, it, it runs really well for me as well. It reminds me of like um, I, I say this in the video that'll be going up, but like uh, it reminds me of kind of like the Avengers or the Avengers Two. Is like I can't imagine anybody being like this is my favorite game of all time, but I can imagine that it has like really really broad appeal yeah. and like the people working on it are extremely talented and the game is like very very polished like well made uh it, it's pretty much just fun like it, it 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 that's been my experience with it so far is it's like i'll pop in for like two or three hours a night and then be like that's enough for now but i'm, I'm definitely going to finish it I'm, I'm closing in on the end i do feel like it's a little long but that's probably a good thing for a lot of people in the bit that i played the Bug. only couple of things that bugged me the main thing that bugged me honestly was there was uh, at the end of the first temple there was this one relic sitting in a place that i couldn't quite figure out how to get to and then at the very end of that set piece, you get forced into an exposition moment, and then you've got to escape. And I wasn't oh, done looking for that it. relic, and then I had to just leave it behind, even though I didn't want to leave yet. Which, I mean, that's just the way they flow the game, I guess that makes sense. But, like, let me know we're about to start a thing so I can finish my exploration first, you yeah, know? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And also, I... she's a really seasoned, like, climber, and yet there's so many surfaces she can't touch because they're not part of the usual path to get where you're right. going. You're not allowed to explore. I See, I was under the impression that this game was more open-ended or more open-world-esque, but I guess that's not the case. I think it's little hubs within... Yes. Okay. Yeah. A couple of times throughout the, the storyline, you will hit a place that is like a pseudo-hub world, and uh -huh. then... Like, the set, basically, you'll be in an area, and it'll be like, hey, there's an optional tomb nearby. Explore if you want to find it. But if you don't want to find it, just go ahead to the next objective, and, like, What's you're good to go. What's the incentive to explore is loot? I mean... There's it, coins, uh, which tie into a meta system with cards that you can buy. <laughs> I, th really I think the, okay, the reward is for... The reward is intrinsic. Like, if you enjoy 
being a completionist in the game, you'll enjoy it. But you, like, like, like Mike was saying. But you also do, when you complete the optional tombs, you usually get, like, a... It's the equivalent of getting, like, a, an optional skill mastery. So, like, okay. if you complete one tomb, then it'll be like, hey, now you can fire two arrows without having to draw your bow twice. Like, you can fire them in quick succession. So, you know, stuff like that. It does, it does make it better or easier on you, but you don't need it to be easier. Sounds like a little bit easy. like... Um... Assassin's Creed 2. Remember the like weird tombs you the optional tombs Roman you could go into? Yeah, yeah like yeah. and there's like loot at the end of that stuff. So it sounds similar to that. I, I mean I'm interested in, in playing it, but I just haven't had the time. Kind of odd to me that since we had the review keys, they came with uh like DLC included, which were I don't really know how to put this. They were special like unlocks that give you a deck of cards, and then the deck of cards unlocks skills or something. I have no idea how that works. I, I, I opened really all want my packs. the advantage, but it was yeah. already there, so I opened all my packs, and I was like, I have no idea what the hell this stuff does. But then, like, when I got back into the game, it was like, hey, you've got, like, a new bow and arrow. And I was like, all right. It just like, gave you a weapon for some reason. If there's anything that bums me out about that game, it is that I feel like Crystal Dynamics, at its core, I, this is a guess, I can't speak for them, but they want to make, like, uh, a really cinematic Tomb Raider experience. Yeah. But then there's people, like, from maybe from within or maybe from like a marketing department at Square Enix or something that are like, nah, like we need to compromise that mechanic a little bit. We need to put like currency that you can find in the game, which makes like you're looting ancient currency, like relics. And then you, you trade them to a dude who gives you like upgraded weapons. And they try to like, they're like, well, he, he can't have cash because cash is traceable. Well, you don't have to pay him with these, like, Byzantine <laughs> coins you looted from a temple. That are worth, like, incredible amounts of money, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. And these he's like, Roman okay. golden coins, yeah, it's just like... Like, bow these and are arrow. priceless. And he's like, yeah, okay, here's a lockpick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just gave you a ton of money. And then, like, there's, a. Uh, like, the lootable stuff, I do get... I, I get, like, a, almost a Witcher kind of fatigue from tapping the right analog stick all the time, <laughs> to, which mm. gives you the objective vision, so now you can be oh, like... okay, yeah, Now you yeah. can be like, oh, there's coins here, there's a, a map here, there's, like, shit here, here's my objective. So there'll be like, I, I've got to rescue Jacob! And then... Jacob! I don't know why okay. she's Steve Irwin. Almost. I've got to rescue Jacob! And then she's yeah, like, okay, man. there's the objective right in front of me, but let's... Go a little bit to the right, crack this open, get a couple of screws, go over here, break this tree, I got some wood, go over here. I gotta here. level up my Greek first, yeah. let's read this pillar. That's <laughs> like actually mine, a thing, you level up your Greek. You level beginning. up, like, a language? Yeah, yeah the more artifacts you what? find in a specific language. So weird. <laughs> I don't know. She's a Tomb Raider, man, you think she'd learn the language before she went? No, she reads the posters on the wall, and, and she just like, learns? now I understand this, and that then she goes no to sense. another place. Yeah. There are, there are some elements that I feel are just kind of shoehorned in. It's, That's weird. But I don't care. The game's super fun. It's just yeah, It's interesting to see, like, Tomb Raider having progressed and turned into what it is, because it was like, Tomb Raider Underworld was terrible or mediocre at best, and then Uncharted kind of came along okay. and did Tomb Raider, but better. Yeah. And so then Tomb Raider came back and like, well, we'll be like Uncharted, and now we're kind of Uncharted, but our own yeah, brand of Uncharted. Yeah, Basically, it's weird. It's basically like... In, uh, Indiana Jones game. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. it's pretty much female Indiana Jones, which is really cool. Which is exactly I, what Uncharted is. It's I an think Indiana there's Jones room for it, too, right? Like, oh, yeah. it's not yeah. a very saturated uh, mm -hmm. thematically in, in, the, in, in games and stuff like that. I mean, we're seeing a lot of, you know, kind of survival, space, sci-fi kind game. of, like, games and stuff Sign like that. Sign me up. <laughs> Do I get to chop trees? Yeah, yeah. man, come play The Forest with no, me. No, I've played it. so much <laughs> of The Forest, I'm so sick of that game. They Tomb just Raider, updated, though. The last cool. Tomb Raider I was really hoping was going to take survival seriously and look at this like a simulation, but it ended up being sort of half arcadey and just over-the-top violent. I was just really hoping they would go in that direction, but now that they've decided on it being Indiana Jones cinematic Uncharted World, I guess I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. I'm they much found what they that. liked. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, is like, as long as they commit to something, I think that gives them an advantage. Yeah. I just... Yeah. For me, I wish there weren't those mechanics that I feel are shoehorned in, but I know, like, if you're trying to justify a purchase that is going to be, uh, you know, 30 hours instead of 15 hours, yeah. then having the ability to, like, you know, have all that shit in there to get platinum trophies and make that, like, a little extended makes sense. The optional tombs are fun, too. Like, uh, I don't know if Nick got far enough in. And, Mike, how much have you played? Uh, literally zero. I've, it's, oh, okay. I've really wanted to play. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of, uh, of just, like, hitting it hard this weekend and and uh it's a getting through game if you want to well that's actually kind of one of the one of the things <laughs> i was wondering if you very know exciting. that's something people would you know because certain games as you guys know they're very streamable some aren't but yeah. um if it's got as nice a flow as i'm hearing from from you guys like it's almost like 
you know, I'm playing a movie or whatever, and and it, you know, people are yeah, watching. Feels just like, like that. So I think, I, yeah. yeah. There's there's logical spots. Uh, it's not it's not an episodic game, but you know, there's like parts of the game that are like 45 minutes long. So you like chain them together and play as much as you want, basically. And it's very obvious when you stop playing. Mm -hmm. You're not like, oh, maybe if I stop playing now, there's a set piece like in 10 seconds. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's really good. I think a lot of people are going to sleep on it because it came out already. Like it's got this new mm -hmm. new oldness going on or old newness because it's yeah. been out for three months, but just came out on PC. And I do think that there's um, I don't even want to call it a bias, but I think that it, it's got an uphill battle as a game that is expensive and perceived as short and people sometimes have complaints about it being a lot of cutscenes. There's like no QTEs. There's almost no there's QTEs. Some. There some. When you fall off things, you gotta hit X at the right moment. That, that happens, that happens regularly, but at the same That's time, there's, is, there's no like scripted segments anymore that are like, this guy rushes at you, hit B, right, get out right, of the right, way, right. and then like mash Y. Um, there is like Assassin's Creed style combo stuff where it'll give you like a button prompt over somebody and then you finish them. But, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, like I, I, I would really recommend it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate. Like, uh, it's robust too. Like, I've got eight hours in it, and probably at least two or three from the end, and I've basically just been doing the story and like a, an optional tomb here and there. So I, I think it's longer than the original for sure. In the three hours I've played, I get the impression that this is probably going to be my favorite Tomb Raider that has existed. It's oh, wow. just stunning right. looking. It's More so, so pretty. than the original. Sadly, yeah. <laughs> you don't like square boobies like the rest well, of us, It's Nick? not about the square boobies. It's really about locking the dude in the meat locker at the beginning. Um, can you get to her manor ever? Does that ever open up? I don't believe so. That, that would have been the coolest That'll be in the fallback. third game. That'll be in the, the third game. game. The game kind of opens with a, um, I guess, like a prelude, but I don't think you actually get to do, like, playable stuff in the manor. All right. Hmm. I'm for it. I recommend Sweet. it. It's real good. You don't well, need to have played the original or the, no, the reboot sure. either. I, I actually had to Wikipedia to be like, is this uh, necessary? Is this a sequel or a prequel? Because I I finished Tomb Raider 2013. That's a reboot, I, right? I remember it. Well, that's what I mean. Like, uh, you don't have to play the reboot to under understand Rise of the oh, Tomb Raider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it just fits in kind of like as a serial, I guess. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on it. Cool. Yeah. That's Rise of the Tomb Raider. It's already out now on Steam and on Xbox One, and we assume it'll be on PS4. I think they said holiday of this year so it's, really it's, oh that's that's yeah, it's like super far out it's really far <laughs> that really away it sucks yeah Dude, no, that ps4 game, gets fucked uh it's gonna get slept on i think that yeah that's all you can get it on pc just get it on pc it feels new as new on pc right now yeah that's what i, I i'm looking forward to jumping on it but <laughs> from one square enix game to another it's time to talk about hitman the new one so it was announced a few couple weeks ago but we didn't have a podcast last week uh that they are officially like chopping up hitman into a bunch of episodes i think initially the plan was like a, the the prequel or whatever the, the new game was going to be like one episode and then the full game was going to come out now square enix is like no the whole game is going to be in installments and uh the number of installments is unknown um people are speculating that they're gonna hold out until they see how the first or second one ends up selling uh i guess maybe they just square like i'm just curious the thought process that square enix has like, did Absolution sell so poorly that this new Hitman cannot be a full $60, like, one-time purchase exper experience? They really need to cut this thing up into multiple episodes. And this is also happening to Final Fantasy VII Reboot, which is going to be... Maybe for development reasons, man. Why, why, why assume that it being cut up episodically is a bad thing, necessarily? You really think... Like, I'm not saying it's going to be a bad thing, but I don't... I mean, do you really think it needs to be? Like, it's Hitman, me? man. To me, it's a bit concerning. I don't want to say it's bad. You know, it could obviously it worries very me. good. It worries but it, to me. me, it's kind of say, well, if, you know, they're deciding how many episodes to have, it's like they're deciding, you know, the story as it goes. It's almost like they're just kind of w winging it a little bit. -ish. Right, they could drop so, like, it if it doesn't sell well one episode. Right. You know, like we're just talking about Tomb Raider, and it was kind of it's very, like, you know, generally linear, and it's like, you know, they made the game that they, they wanted to make, more or less. Whereas this, they're kind of like, well, we'll see if you guys like the first episode. Then, you know, we'll we'll make more and more. But it's like, I don't Absol know. I'm looking at sales numbers for Absolution. And three years ago, it had 3.6 million sold. I don't think it's, it's a fair thing to just assume that it sold poorly and this is motivating the decision. 
So like, you... The Walking Dead was was episodic. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean the show is not popular. Yeah. Also, but didn't it... Square Enix go on record as saying they had like a really weird uh, correlation of what they consider to be a success for a game? Right. Like, well, Tomb yeah, Raider they said really that well, the like, reboot. That yeah, the reboot of Tomb Raider sold like three million copies, and they're like that did not do as we wanted it to. I was but... like, okay. With the with the Walking Dead, I mean, it was episodic, and you know, other games are, but. Does that mean, you know, they didn't have the idea of what each episode was going to be at the, you know, the front of development? Like, I don't know um, if that was the case or, you know, and they're just releasing yeah. it episodically because they needed time to work on it. And they kind of rather say, well, at least we'll give them one episode. They can they can play it kind of thing. Whereas this, it sounds more like they're just like, all right, let's just kind of make up the story as we go. If people like it, then we'll keep keep doing it i don't know that's that's where i'm a little and didn't concerned. rumors come out that the with the deus ex the same thing was going to happen but because of the backlash like they just ended up cutting a ton of the game or whatever and not finishing it like the new one i you know i don't feel comfortable saying yes or no without the actual news in front of me but i'll look like my my thing with hitman is that i think uh with i i think you can make tomb raider episodic i understand the point you're trying to make like they made the game that i said they made the game they wanted to make I, I don't necessarily think that Tomb Raider would suffer from being an episodic game. And I think that Hitman is kind of modular in the same way where, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what happened in Absolution, and partly that might be because the story sucked. But I could be like, oh, there's the Chinatown level, there's like the the uh, hotel level where the fire happens, there's like the subway level, there's the level in the cornfield with the nuns, there's the level where you get like the bunny suits. Like, the, it's, it's all about, for me at least, is the... Um, <laughs> The levels where you can actually, or like, the levels are like a sandbox that you can play around with, as opposed to, like, the, there being an overarching Hitman story. Like, yeah. that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is being able to be like, well, on this level, you can do some cool stuff where you, like, poison this dude's burrito and then he dies ten minutes later or something. I feel, I feel like the message that Mathis is trying to get across here and where I could also potentially get on board is the difference between buying singles on iTunes versus buying an album, Right. I'd rather see the composition be placed throughout in the album where you get to see the beginning, middle, and end versus we can adapt after we get sales figures and demographic information, peer-reviewed, you know, like focus groups. It, you know, I just want to see a whole focused full uh, game. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I guess, yeah, that's where I'm coming from. But it's like, I don't mind episodic games, but if everything they're going to do is going to become episodic, I, I'm worried that they're just going to try and – my worry, I guess, as a consumer is they're just going to milk us for all we're worth. And if we did, they don't sell enough. They're never gonna finish the story. And don't buy it. Like, and I, I, there's a good yeah, chance I won't. But, but like it's again, about, but I love the series, and I don't right. want to see it turn into that. Exactly. Well. No, it's not like it's not a real thing. Like it's it's a, it's a me piece of media. Like if you if the if you are gonna be cynical and say that this is like it's milking or like it's a cash grab, then you owe it to yourself and the other people who agree with you to not support it, even if you do like the series. But if, the, but again, like, if you're gonna chop it up in episodes, don't they have a duty to say we're gonna at least finish this? Like, finish I don't know it? if they do. Honestly. You don't like, think so? I, I, is there any duty like in in the games industry? I think it, it comes down to, you know, what is actually working. Like, if episode one comes out and it's fucking horrible, I, I don't think that they have to be like, well, we're committed to doing like five more of these to finish the story. Yeah, I, I don't think that helps anybody. So you'd rather have it just come out as a full vision done from beginning to end and if it tanks it tanks if it doesn't it doesn't that's versus right. the course correction where you could say well this looked good then it kind of went a little off and then now we're just dropping the whole thing i'm not saying like one is better than the other i'm just saying you yeah. know we already so have episodic math, really. we have episodic games and some of them work and some of them don't but like i i, I can't be like well from what i've played a hitman like it doesn't work as an episodic game like we have to figure out we have to at least give them a chance to come out with it. They're the ones yeah. who actually have the information of how it's developed. We see, like, one trailer six months ago form an idea in our head of what the product is going to be, barely remember it, and then we get the news and we're like, ah, it's episodic now, you blew it. Like, it might, this might be the proper way to handle it. I, I think you have to at least let it come out before passing judgment on it. I, it's not even that I'm passing judgment on it, I just worry, I mean... The, the the idea I formed in my head is, is based on Hitman Absolution. Like, if I can, I enjoyed Hitman Absolution. I know there are, like, the purists who hated Absolution or didn't like it that much. But if you're going from Absolution, which was a good finished product, to being like, well, we're going to take that idea now and we're going to chop it up and sell it to you in bits. I just don't understand. I guess I just don't understand the thought process as to why that's the direction they're going. And I just want to understand why 
they went from a full finished sixty dollar experience to episodic, you know, uh, gameplay. I mean, it just Hitman. I don't know. Hitman in my mind does not fit the episodic model, and I probably won't touch it until it comes out as like all the episodes are out and I can buy the whole thing if it's good. Um, but I, I, it's just weird. It's just weird that that Hitman is what they're gonna break up. I can almost understand Final Fantasy VII a little bit. But I don't get it with Hitman at all. I'm less I, on board for Final Fantasy VII than I would be for Hitman, honestly. How come? But I'm well because I feel like the story of an RPG kind of needs to be cemented in place. Yeah, I I get when Ryan put it that way of you know in the perspective of you know Hitman is very mission based, right? There's a very concrete like start <laughs> and end. You know each each yeah each hit, right? So you know putting it in that perspective, it makes a little more sense in the whole episodic and it could be beneficial because you know the missions are very memorable like you think of the game even if they release the whole game and there's like 12 missions right like you think of each mission as its own discrete thing like oh i love that mission with the ice cream truck or whatever kind of thing so um i think releasing it episodically could allow them more time to really focus on single mission or whatever it ends up being at a time and it could end up being like really beneficial and they're making mm -hmm. some awesome missions and then they're not quite as rushed because maybe people are used to the idea okay well they're gonna release this mission when it's done rather than just releasing 10 half-assed missions all in one package kind of thing so it could prove to be more beneficial for this type of game i don't know it's my yeah Whatever. Screw your speculating for the sake of conversation. Yeah, well, exactly. yeah, I mean, obviously, I just, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm more cynical than most when it comes to that kind of thing. I don't like, I get stuff like Telltale games are episodic because that's just the only type of games they really make, and it's, it's point and click adventures, and I like that idea of you could tell, tell certain parts of the story in chapters like an, like a, like a book or a TV show because that's how they're done. I guess, yeah, you know, when you bring it up like that and say, you know, maybe Hitman chopping it up into, into missions and selling you those missions as long as they're good. And they're not going to, like, overcharge you for, like, an hour's worth of content or whatever. I guess yeah. it's another thing. I'm curious how long each episode's going to be. That's, Very, yeah. That that, that concerns was... me, too. Because in, in Hitman Absolution, there was, like, you could you could finish a mission in, like, 45 minutes. Or you could finish it in 10 minutes, depending on how you decided you wanted. Did you want to shoot him in the face? Or did you want to take the elaborate, I'm going to poison him, follow him, that other yeah. thing? So I'm curious how that's going to be factored into it as well well it yeah. could also if you go the episodic route it could really focus on the density of content for one area right mm -hmm. so if the very focus replayable is, kind of thing you get one yeah. mission today you might have a ton of different things to do in that one mission versus that it's more focused around the narrative it, it, you know getting larger throughout the whole experience could well, be a positive yeah uh, ryan and i we have a, a friend um yeah. from high school he's he's always been pretty into the hitman uh, games and even playing the older stuff you know very recently you'll go through the missions several times i mean because that's that's always been there you know one of the the things about hitman is like there's several ways to skin a cat there's right, several right. ways to yeah. skin your hit right you kill them how you want sneak around put on different costumes and stuff like that and just you know seeing how it plays out so um yeah maybe you can i guess do the mission uh, potentially in 10 minutes or something like that. But a lot of people that are going to be buying Hitman, I think, are, you know, going into it with maybe the idea of replayability and doing the missions a few times. So it it might multiply. So Could be leaderboards. I, could be objectives, you know? Yeah. My yeah. thinking is just, like, this is a, a AAA episodic game, basically the likes of which we haven't seen before. And there are, like, yeah. some gotcha moments. You know, I know there's a Half-Life episode like half-life 2 episode 1 and then you know it adds it's not the same item. and they never finished it they never finished it yeah. they never I gave never us episode 3 I was waiting for episode 3 that doesn't mean that like <laughs> god like, damn it <laughs> it's not like i here's my perspective would you rather have episode 1 or nothing and they of course the the caveat <laughs> say i'd rather have the full thing but it's not like it's not equivocal like I if guess, you say okay yeah. hitman's not going to be episodic that doesn't make it any more likely to come out and be a good game, yeah. is my perspective on the issue. But it, this is, like like Nick was saying, it's speculation. And, like, we don't know how much it's going to cost, how long each section is going to be. All we know is that, you know, to, to a certain extent, I trust... Uh, is it IO? 
IO yes, Interactive. I think I, so. I, to I a certain extent, I trust them. I think that they've done a, a, I thought they did a pretty good job with Absolution, which I know a lot of people disagree with. But I, I like Absolution, it, yeah. I thought it was at least not a cash grab. And this isn't a sequel that's coming out the next year. This is four years later. Yep. Uh, and I, I trust them to, enough to at least give them a shot. Like, I think they've earned at least a chance to fuck it up. And if they come out with it and it sucks, <laughs> then they're, then that's it, you know? But if they come out with it and it works, then that's good. And if they're $20 episodes, each one is, like, a few hours long, that's one thing. If they come out with $20 episodes and each one is, like, 45 minutes long, that's, that's not very good at all, probably. But, um, I think we at least owe it to them to give them a chance. And I, I don't know. I wouldn't operate under the assumption that it's more of a cash grab to do an episodic game. Because, you know, if, instead of doing an episodic game, maybe what they do is they come out with a $60 Hitman game and a $30, you know, season pass DLC yeah, right. and then, like, $15 weapon packs and stuff like that. So yeah. I think they should at least... I, I, but that's my approach with everything. Is like, unless it's overtly evil, like, just wait and, wait and see. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Do you, do you think there's a parallel to be drawn with Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes? Cause that I think kind so, of yeah. Well, Maybe I thought that was their initial direction. approach they were taking, right? Wasn't they going to do, like, a Ground Zeroes-esque thing and then release the full game? It was to, like, whet your appetite while you're yeah. waiting for five. Although I never played Ground Zeroes, so I heard it was bad. <laughs> it was all right. I, I, heard it was, I heard it was bad, and I heard it was, like, amazing. Oh. <laughs> I know there, there are some people that have, <laughs> like, 20... <laughs> some people have, like, 25 hours in Ground Zeroes, and they're like, check out all these ways you can make this work. And then some people have, like, two oh. hours in it, and they're like, hey, I beat it, and I don't, I don't really get it. A testament to bucks. the That's versatility where I and how uh, differently people perceive media. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. True. Well, I guess we'll see when it comes out. I mean, I don't think there's even a full set release date for it yet, but be interested to see what happens when it comes out. I guess I'll, I'll just I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm glad my, it's in. I don't have my a lot higher of order. <laughs> my higher order problem is that every, almost every piece of news that isn't like a console price cut is everybody assumes the worst about in the video games industry. So I do have a chip on my shoulder about like what I consider to basically be news that could go either way and people like automatically jump on the side of cynicism. I, I feel like unless Square Enix was like, hey, the new Hitman comes out tomorrow and it's got an eight hour demo and if you like it after that, pay what you want, then people are gonna be like, oh, that's nice. But if they say <laughs> anything else, then people are like, oh, Square Enix is a company trying to make money. Like I am, I am, Cons pro consumer but you also have to sort of like be open minded like it, just being cynical about everything is just like i don't know it's just i hear you i hear you I, there's also a part of me though that feels like for the last 10 years we've been chasing the idea of can you just release a good game at a normal <laughs> price point yeah. everyone's got a fucking gimmick that goes in some direction or another we just want a normal game released in full on yeah. a day i wish evolve was that <laughs> evolve like, is like the one that always sticks out of my mind of the game that they just chopped up into like that, yeah evolve is a great game that is almost ruined by extraneous stuff like yeah. that you that deserves to be cynical about for sure i mean even tomb raider i was like well tomb raider is a complete game that came out but then i'm like oh it's xbox one exclusive for a while and then now <laughs> PC, it's pc yeah. and it'll take nine months to get on the that's what i mean PS4. just like cut all this shit just release a game that we can play the i end. think i think it's just you know people are concerned because of a general admiration for for the hitman games and stuff like that they offer something uh a lot of other games don't really have that whole hitman premise and you know when they go and switch to a different model of doing something episodically you know it's like oh you know it's cause for concern but i think the end result is people just really want like a good game good missions and stuff like that so if that's what it turns out to be great um so well, yeah. We'll, I hope. Well, I hope for the best. I really do. Yeah. I really hope for the yeah. best. And if it's good, uh, I'll, I'll still probably wait for the whole bundle package to come out. But I do hope it's going to be great. Uh, that'll basically cover it for all like the big game announcements. We got a couple, a, a couple of small things to talk about. Uh, we can go right to City Skylines Snowfall expansion that's announced. That I know Malf has a few things he wants to talk about about oh. that. <laughs> oh, so I mean, we've all we. I feel like recently we just talked about like nightlife and stuff which was an expansion the heck that just came out for it and now snowfall is coming out and uh mouth why don't you just go ahead and take it away ruined <laughs> um, ruined <laughs> yeah um well this is uh i mean this is something that's near and dear to my heart because i i generally enjoy city simulations and uh i've been playing city skyline since it it came out um it it's a bit bothersome to me and to a lot of other people like if you're on uh, the subreddit for City Skylines, you'll usually see comments and stuff 
uh, about. I people... hear that's how Reddit works. <laughs> <laughs> people, you know, they make comments and they talk about stuff. But, it's a great um, place for positive feedback. Yeah, they. A lot of people, especially when After Dark first came out, too, they were kind of like, oh, like more content, that's cool and stuff. But what about all these issues we've been talking about for the past few months since you released the first, you know, the core game, right? There's a lot of. Um, fundamental components of the game that people aren't necessarily happy about um you know traffic ai for instance people are like it just doesn't quite make sense and you're you're making your city based around trying to minimize congestion but you're doing it in ways that don't really mimic how it would be, it would be done in the real world so you're not making actual cities that are simulating real <laughs> world cities kind of thing um and instead, they've been putting focus into more content than fixing this fundamental stuff. And, you know, then you've got people making mods, some really good mods. And it's, like, awesome that they're there. But, again, people are really bitter about that. They're like, why are you relying on people making these free mods and spending their time to fix your broken core game? So that's kind of, like, it settled a little bit. And now that they're coming out with Snowfall, it's like, oh, shit, like, here's more content and you're still not fixing some of these things um and just to highlight for people that want to know what is happening in snowfall basically they're adding uh well snow so there's going to be winter maps but the thing is it's not going to affect the other maps that you have they won't get snow you have to play this new map that always has snow there's no like seasons or anything like that huh. uh that which is you know um it's really weird. That yeah, weird. We can, yeah, we can get, in, get into that. <laughs> um, just the other couple things they're adding, they're doing streetcars, um, something people have been asking about for a while, which is, is fine. It's nice. Um, but only in Snowfall? No, streetcars can be for for any city as far as I know. Okay, but you have um, to buy Snowfall to get it? Um, well, the thing was, um, yeah, it was Snowfall. You have to buy it to get, and it's 13 U.S. dollars for Snowfall as okay. well. Um, okay, you okay. know, whether that's worth it to some people, I don't know. Uh, world warmth is another thing, so cold weather will drive up demand for electricity, um, and you can use a new water-based heating system and stuff like that. But again, that's but, something that will only be on the winter map. And you said the winter map doesn't change seasons. No, so it's really, it's just like winter. a harder difficulty when it comes to like power necessity. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, you know, if there's the whole so world weird. warmth thingy, then maybe there'll be an added metric in the game where it's like, all right, this is the temperature today or okay. something. Maybe it's randomly done. Um, I don't really know how they're gonna handle that. Um, and then as well, they're adding like a snowplow depot, so you can put that in your your winter thingy. So you have to worry about the logistics of, of that. And huh. of course, they have new chirps. Because we all love the chirps. Oh um, yeah, the little Twitter thing. Oh yeah. yes. Uh, that's so weird. I mean, that's like a weird addition to make it like one map or a specific type of map and not like just open up like seasons in general that's on what all we the all, maps. I imagine would want right. You just want a normal year to experience your city, and you want day and night, and then the four seasons. At the same time, isn't this like what? trademark paradox where? The game came out a year ago, yeah. and like every three to six months, there will be like a paid DLC with a lot of like free fe free features that come in a patch yeah. alongside of it. Like reading at least the PSA or the the press release uh, makes me feel like this is like Crusader Kings Two DLC, where for people on the outside, you're like, what do I care? They added like you know, Gavelkind Succession to like this historically or this a historical nation or something like that. Um, but then the free stuff usually is is really nice as well. And I, I kind of see it as like a way for them to indirectly fund their continuing support of the game, which is not to say that like everybody should buy Snowfall, but mm -hmm. like the people who are really into it and can't live without it basically in a way finance the continued support of the game for everybody well, else. Well, they talked about it at Paradox Con when I was there, when the game before the game was out, that the way they were going to approach it with expansions was the same way they do EU4 CK2 stuff, which is frequent mini expansions with free content attached for all players mm -hmm. which is fine i think that's a good way to do things i like that at kind of like angle a lot the problem i guess is where where mike is talking about too outside of the fact that it's not really seasons it's one map and it's weird is that they haven't ad addressed problems that have been in the game since yeah. the beginning yeah and i think i mean they've talked about it a lot where 
Um, certain things are a limitation of the engine, right? Um, Unity! Some people, yeah, some people complained about assets, right? Like, you can... Uh, the biggest thing for people uh, at first for City Skylines is like, oh, you can make these huge cities and stuff like that, unlike uh, SimCity where you had this small little box and it just didn't make very much sense. Um, but there is still a limit um, to the amount of assets. So your city can only reasonably get up to a certain size and population before um, it's either just going to be like, no, you, like, you've literally hit the asset limit or you straight up, your computer's going to blow up because it's simulating so much stuff going on. So, you know, that was like um, an issue and a lot of the other stuff that they've run into. But I think it's just so hard coded into the engine that even if they wanted to, I'm sure they want to fix like some of the, you know, AI and different things like that. But even if they wanted to, it just, it wouldn't be reasonable. They'd have to go so deep into the code. So I'm almost thinking and hoping that they're taking in a lot of the feedback um, in terms of the way the game is is set up. And if we get a city skyline too, yeah, you know, it's going to address a lot of these core features and stuff like that. Um, I think that's, I mean, really the only way they can can handle it. But um, again, yeah, some of the stuff in the in this DLC here. Uh, it's not ideal, I guess, with the yeah the way that the snow works. I don't see how that's uh, something they couldn't just do seasons. I mean, they've got a day night cycle. Why not just do? Yeah, that's that's. I think the thing I'm most hung up on is like, why just do seasons, man? Yeah, yeah. this makes me more conscious of the fact that it's like more <laughs> fragmented than it needs to be, and yeah. now I just want to completely not play it and wait for the second one that does it all properly, and I mean, then I can well. get in on that. Yeah, I'm it's kind of like a, it's a half measure, is what it seems like. Is like yeah. yeah. You're gonna add snow, but it's just like one map is always gonna be snowy. That's well, like they, when you work on like a project, you're like writing an essay or something, and you're like, "Well, I want to change it, but if I change this, I have to rewrite <laughs> every whole essay." Yeah. So you're just like, "I'll just put like a paragraph in here that'll like do it half well." It addresses you know? it, whatever. I, yeah, I don't think people yeah. get off on the idea of like I have a city that's always winter. I would rather experience what we want to be the naturalistic life we exist in. So that doesn't really fit that. Well, they are, as well, adding on the non-winter maps. Um, they're going to add in rain and fog. Uh, I, okay. I mean, other than that being a, a visual thing, I don't think there's any Like, no gameplay, gameplay effects? You know, there's not, like, going to oh. be plows or, or different things. Um, I, I'm not sure that that is going to affect right. um, cars and stuff like that. You know, having, you know, car accidents. It's not like there are car accidents and stuff now, but, um, you know, that's something that's... Would be interesting to see in the winter map, at least, you know, with the icy, snowy conditions, if there's, like, yeah. you know, crashes and stuff, just to further immerse the whole simulation thingy and not just be kind of a cosmetic thing. Because, like, I don't know, like, yeah, it's it'll be cool to watch snow plows go around, but other than just, like, plunking in a couple depots and making sure they have coverage, there's right. not really too much more to the gameplay than that, so... It's like placing down like a police station and making sure they have coverage. Yeah, exactly. They need it. Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm glad that they are adding more content to it generally, um, and it gives people a little, you know, more to to be creative with and stuff like that. I mean, people spend a lot of time with these cities, so yeah. um, it's nice that they can maybe customize them a little more. I'm I'm pretty excited for the streetcars. Like that'll be a a nice yeah. cute cute little touch, but. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see. I I don't uh, I don't know what they have on the horizon after after this, but there's there's a lot of stuff. Like I've got a laundry list somewhere of things I would love to see them add, just in terms of content. But I'd love to see like I would like to see a City Skylines too. I mean, I I liked I liked the vanilla release well enough, and I think it did super well for them. So mm -hmm. I'd love to see them take it and and really kind of expand on that idea quite a bit. Yeah, I feel like we're in this weird era for games. At the risk of coming across as anti-consumer <laughs> as well, where if you come out with a game like City Skylines, sorry, that's like where you're at for the next four years. It's like you're contractually prohibited. The contract <laughs> Do between, else? between you and consumers is that you will support that game until people are sick of it, and then you can make City Skylines too. I feel like, well, I mean, I feel like that wouldn't be a thing we would be worrying about if they didn't announce that they were going to be supporting it in a paradox-like fashion before the game even came out. I guess, like, now, you, you can't be worried that they won't support it. Right. I just, in a way, I'm sort of like, well, if you want City Skylines too, like, 
you're gonna be waiting a while. Yeah. Been, and it's not anybody's fault, you know. I mean, most people who own City Skylines would probably rather that they just continue to support it if they're still playing it. But if they want to make like wide sweeping changes, which it sounds like if they wanted to fix the traffic, they would have to. I, I, mean, I don't know if that's if that's true from a development standpoint, but I do remember reading like the AMA and the CEO was like, we basically can't change yeah, the traffic. So yeah, right. and other things too. I mean, like um, asset size, for instance, right? And, you know, the buildings are all on a four by four kind of plot. Um, I recently, because in in one of uh, my my episodes, I I was building like a uh, a golf course. Some guy made like all uh, he modeled it after the. Banff, whatever golf oh, course, yeah, yeah. and um, <laughs> you know uh, they're they're big, right? They're huge. So how do you model that accurately uh, in the game? And some guy made a a mod. It's basically stitches together assets, so you could have you know these buildings and certain things that are bigger than the standard four by four asset. So I mean, you know, it's it's good. I'm glad they did it, but again, it's a sore point for a lot of people. It's like, oh, great, we got to rely on another Modest, mod yeah. to to fix this. And then every time they update the game, it's like, all right, now you need to wait uh, sometimes a couple weeks before the mod is again compatible with it, or it might just freaking break your save um, <laughs> because you've got all these mods. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of work playing the game sometimes. I mean, once you really get into it and you've got all these mods and stuff like that, so. But um, I think I think again, you know, they they have really done a pretty decent job in terms of at the very least listening to the community. Um, so people are really passionate about it, and they're like, they're taking it all in. But I mean, like Ryan said, there's just certain things that they can't fix right now. I think it will require, you know, CD Skylines too to yeah. to really right. address. Well, it can't probably meaning could, but it's prohibitive, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Like not probably nothing's impossible. Uh, you you could turn the traffic all into you know like human centipedes that that go around the city or something like that. But I'd like to see you know. that mod. There you go, dude. But I, the modding <laughs> conversation is so funny because I'm so excited for like Afterbirth Plus. Even though I'm yeah. I'm adver averse to uh, using mods most of the time just because I'm lazy. <laughs> like it'll be like 36 hours and there'll be like mod that reverts shit that is broken to its previously fixed state. Right, and right. Like, hey, that's sweet. Like, we wouldn't have waited, like, eight months for friends uh, till the end to come back into the game as a pill, even though these I are, like, relatively minor things. Yeah, me too. <laughs> or, like, you know, um... Uh, I guess... Like, narrow rooms that spawn devils deals exactly, beyond yeah, like, where you can reach. So, it's, it may, it's, it's a relatively good game. But, oh, uh, is. <laughs> yeah, like, st stuff like that yeah, will be fixed. More and more that. devs are opening up themselves to more modding anyway. I mean, XCOM 2 launched with three mods from the Long War creators. Yeah. Like, it was packed, like, it was like, oh, we got three mods for you right off the bat. So, I mean, you shouldn't have to rely on modders to fix the game. The game should just be fixed by the developers, but I guess you kind of can take what you can get. It just sucks they work that... together, I don't see a problem yeah. in it. I agree with I, that, yeah. And, I mean, Colossal Order might have, like... 30 people? I don't no, know. No, they were, well, okay, maybe now. But yeah. what, at, like, launch, there was 10. They had 10 people. Okay, so yeah, maybe they expanded, maybe they didn't. But, yeah. like, at that size, you're never going to be able to compete with at least the sheer frequency of right. or, of modders or, like, quantity of modders out there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel the frust. I understand the frustration. If you want City Skylines to be a platform for you to play a city builder, then... The traffic is something that probably needs to be fixed, but Maya, chill out. If if you just if if you're playing it as like a game, like for me, I would play a City Skylines too. Nothing that they could do would probably bring me back to City Skylines. I put my 35, yeah, 40 hours into it. I had a good time, and I'm basically like that's. I mean, that's if it. you want a city builder, like this is kind of your only option. Like a good city builder. There's a couple mm. others out there, but they're like trash. This is like your only good city builder from a relatively small team. I'm excited to see what what the future holds i guess so and that's where the entitlement comes from so often i think it's just in the people who love it so much they just yeah. want the most viable option to be embraced to the fullest extent yeah well that's city skyline snowfall uh will be out soon and if you want bugs fixed i guess you download mods it's in two weeks <laughs> apparently that's yeah soon. it's short soon. uh yeah. the only two other options the two other topics that we have down are, are relatively small one i don't think anybody but me is going to give a shit about uh xenonauts 2 was announced I'm very excited for. If you didn't know, Xenonauts 1 is kind of a throwback to old school XCOM. 
Um, it's incredibly hard. The game whooped me over and over and over again. Uh, and with Xenonauts 2, I expect the same, but it'll be like a 3D engine and, and new units, new alien types, and it'll just be better all around. Malf, I saw you nodding your head. Did you play uh, No, but I just, you know, the, the whole yeah. XCOM thing. Old, old like... school XCOM, yep. Yeah. I don't think anybody here but me has played Xenonauts. I played like two hours, but not your like X XCOM Enemy Unknown kind of like made that formula more accessible. It, and yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, Xenonauts hewed more to being uh, faithful to the original series. Yeah. So from what I've heard of the original series, so yeah, I mean, like uh, the the reboot came with like two actions, like that's all you get. Whereas Xenonauts adhered to like time units. Yeah, and each yeah. unit having time units and each action taking a certain number of time units, it was it, it, it's much more difficult. I was terrible, but I enjoyed it. Uh, and then finally, CCP, the creators of EVE, are closing down Dust 514, which is their PS3 exclusive first person shooter that ties directly into the EVE universe, but are continuing to work on Project Legion, but not Legion, as people are calling it. Um, basically, what? the uh -huh. idea of so <laughs> the idea of Dust 514, for people who don't know. It's a first-person shooter. It was a PS3 exclusive. Basically, you, you played ground troops on planets throughout EVE, and you could be funded by corporations, which are EVE's guilds, uh, to try and fight for planets and, you know, get their resources and, and help, like, the EVE Online game. Uh, it didn't... It, there were some cool ideas there, but it wasn't, like, great. Um, there was a lot of problems with it. There was, like, really weird microtransactions. So as far as I've read, uh, the Legion but not Legion is basically... It's Dust 514 again... But, like, on Unreal 4 and for the PC, and they're taking what they've learned, the best bits of Dust 514, and implementing it into this new game that is, we'll be seeing launch whenever they say Damn. it's ready. So it's kind of like, like three levels away from anything they care about. I know. But <laughs> Sorry. for me, I get excited about that kind of thing because I really want to like Eve. I just don't have the time. Um, no, nobody okay, else here gives a shit, a like I said, right? No. Uh, I actually did not realize that Dust 514 had not been shut down earlier. Yeah, that it was, was one of those games on. where, like, when it got announced, the conceptually, everyone was like, this is genius. And then I, I didn't hear about it for, like, four years, and then looked it up and was like, oh, that came out, and, like, nobody plays it. Like, it just, it's yeah. out. I, I was waiting for it, but it's been here forever. Yeah, I remember signing up for the, the beta or whatever, and they're like, oh, yeah, here you go. But then I just, <laughs> not, I didn't, I didn't ever Such cool it. ideas. I love yeah. the ideas of, like, this in-game guild could fund you money. To buy you better, like, guns and stuff for you to, you know, fight on a planet and stuff. and But it just wasn't wasn't what people wanted. Oh, well. That's fine. And that's going to be no it Man's for Sky. main top. Yeah, well, I don't want to talk about No Man's Sky. Okay, let's not talk about No Man's Sky. <laughs> uh, that's going to be it. No Man's Sky, we don't have to talk about until they announce a release date. Right, exactly. <laughs> Then we can we can have some and then we can like yeah worry about it. But well, that's it for the, the main stuff. podcast topics today. So I guess we're going to uh, I, it doesn't sound right when I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Going to everybody's favorite segment, Ask Roundtable. Uh, well, today's test like like Bear died. I know. Well, without <laughs> Bear's guttural voice, it's just not there. But our question of the day comes from Max. Max says, "Hello everyone, big fan of your content and devoted listener." His question is, what do you guys think is the best dorm council? Keeping in mind durability, number of yeah. games, price. Console. Yeah, like dorm console, like console, like college <laughs> dorm console. What would you consider the best? I never stayed in a dorm, so I don't really <sighs> have cool. an opinion. I went to college, I didn't stay in a dorm either, but I have an idea about what they might be interested in. So yeah, he says durability, number of games, price. A number of notably good or influential single player games, cost on a student budget. No, that is not a dorm. Folks. Yeah, you gotta look at the multiplayer. That's, what he said, the, man. that's the that's the key. Land I mean. parties in the quad, man. But uh Brian, we'll start with you. What do you what would you think is the best dorm console right now? You wanna be money? the most popular uh dorm uh, room in the dorm? You get a yourself, gaming PC? Get yourself a Wii U for sure. You got every you're gonna have casual uh you know, like 17, 18, 19 year olds coming over. Everybody knows how to play Mario Part or Mario, Mario Kart, Part. Sorry. Mario, Mario Part, Part, Part 7. You got, you got Smash Bros. You got the Mario games. Like, uh, for sure, I think that if you're trying to get like broad appeal and leverage it for like some social well, You clout, want broad appeal if you're in college. Yeah, it's the Wii true. U is gonna, gonna take you there. And People are gonna really... be coming over to your room to play Mario Kart all the time. I guarantee it. There's some if really you... good single player games on the Wii U too. Bayonetta 1 and 2. Yeah. You've got uh, Xeno, uh, Xeno something, the new RPG. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
a good one. Xeno. I want to say Xeno Gears, but I know it's not Xeno Gears. Xeno. Uh, you can play Rock Band on the Wii as well, right? Uh, no, nah, not on the Wii U, no. Or the Wii U. Oh. Oh, yeah. that's a. Mm. I don't know. In terms of durability, though, you got to think of, um, you know, cartridge. You know, if you go back to the N sixty four, if you can, if you can still find, well, you can find them. I've N64. got one. N sixty four. Um, because you know the cartridges, right? You know, people dorms, people are jumping around. They're all, you know, high on, uh, you know, their their fruit punch and whatnot. And, <laughs> Everybody's high on fruit punch. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, the CDs can get scratched up or whatever. So. If you go back a little older to cartridge-based stuff, you've got your durability you covered buy there. Yeah. You warranty for three dollars for that scratch. That's CD. exactly true. But if you're like, if you're going to college and you're 18 right now, did you you didn't grow up on the N64? Like we were able to mine the N64 for nostalgia when we brought sure. it to our dorm. Everyone was like, "Oh, Smash 64, Mario Kart 64." I remember all these levels in my head. I think kids mm -hmm. these days, if you were born in like 1996. You'd, you'd want to Game bring, like, a, a GameCube, yeah, or a, or a PS2 or something, original Xbox. True. You would be like, oh, my God, the silent cartographer. I used to do Warthog jumping on this. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with you. I think Wii U is probably your best bet. I think there's a lot of good party games, and there's some good single-player options as well. I would vote Wii U. What about you, Nick? You I would with it? say the Xbox 360 Get is out. your best bet. Yeah, I mean, 360. Reason, is a good well, okay, so there's a lot of reasons why it's good. The one reason it's probably bad is not the uh, the adaptability, the the, the breaking thing. It's going to break a lot because yeah, they do. But true. they're dirt cheap now, and everyone's got games for it. So, you know, if you're around, probably everyone in the dorm has something they could put in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's reasonably easy to find controllers. There's plenty of four player games. The online still works for the most part, it's not super expensive. You get some Halo in, you get your gears in, you can have your bros down. Your bros. It's going to be a good time. Fusion Frenzy. Not so much, but there's a lot of other you options out you there. Tried. I mean, I've got like probably 70-something games for the thing. There's plenty out there. Well, I liked the first Fusion, Fusion Frenzy, but not the second one. Okay. So that's my objectively correct answer. There's a <laughs> lot of people in chat though saying, you know, they're they're under 20 years old and they were raised still on N64 I'd and say NES. Broad either. appeal, yeah, man. <laughs> that's like the same thing where like when we would be like 15, people would be like, "Well, you're a little too young for the ColecoVision." I'd be like, "Actually, my friend had a ColecoVision and I played it four <laughs> times. So I'm very familiar with the phone <laughs> controller." Like <laughs> You did, like you may have grown up with it admittedly, but I think the cultural <laughs> touchstone for people that are of that age is probably you know, the consoles that came out when they were six or seven, as opposed to the consoles that came out when they were negative two. <laughs> negative two. That's if you were born option. in 1998, it makes you 18 this year, N64 came out in 1996. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I, I won't say no. I grew There's up left. with a Super Nintendo, but the console that I spent the most time with was probably was definitely the generation that came right after, like the original Xbox and PS2 for sure. Well, just th there's your answer, I guess. What, follow what? your heart. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Get a Wii U. If you're looking, if you want to make friends, get a Wii U. If you want to, if you want to meet more turbo dorks like yourself, get the get a con <laughs> get a different console. And you maybe you do. That's not a bad thing. If you want to be a member of a very incredibly niche club, get an Xbox One. Get an Xbox One and who's gonna Legion, bother with an Xbox Legion. One? Who's gonna play that? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You have like two friends, and that's it. Thank you very much for the question, Max. Uh, I appreciate it. And now it's time for everybody's favorite section after everybody's favorite section. That still does not <laughs> sound right. That's fine, though. It's going to be Nick's Weird Games. Every week, Nick goes and picks a weird game. We guess it. Ryan sings a terrible song. And that is, that is the extent of it. I might not be singing a terrible song anymore. I'm not sure where I don't know. At. I don't know. Well, well, I mean, Malf, let's let you either. You can sing a song, Malf, of your choosing, or you could tell Ryan to sing a song of your choosing. Oh, I... I oh, you have all the power. Mm. But it has to be, you know, in the theme of, of Nick's weird games. What do you mean in the, th the theme of his? You gotta his make up weird... words. You gotta make up words that go along with Nick's weird games. Ryan, you might have to give him an example. Yeah, give me an example. Oh, do I not just do the whole fucking show? Yeah, you show should. So give him a... Excuse you, sir. Nick, go get a game. Malf, so tell Nick. Game? Nick, I mean, Malf, tell Ryan to sing a song. Ryan, sing a song. No, you gotta give him a song. Right. I'll go get a game. Then. Like a real song? Yes, a like... real song. A real song. Okay, how about, uh, what's that Ricky Martin? Living the Vida Loca. Alright, okay. there we go. 
Boot up a PlayStation 1 <laughs> with a shitty Nick's Weird game. It was published in Korea, and it is pretty lame. <laughs> he, he never picks something mean, mainstream, he only picks the crap. You've never heard of it, and if you see it, it's a trap. <laughs> It'll make you take a nap. Come on. <laughs> it's from 2001. <laughs> it's weird games on round table. That it's was not I'm very so... fun. It's this weird games on round table. So, you did a you did a pretty fucking incredible job with it. It will we <laughs> right, so out. Owen. <laughs> and it skins the color. Oh, you did live in Lenita, okay, that's pretty good. All right, yeah. so Mal, if you've never played this game with us before, the no. idea is hide chat. Nick is going to give us details, like little snippets about the game that he's picked out from like the back of the box and all that stuff. Publisher, oh, yeah. and we minimize chat. We yep, have to. Done. We have to. With the information given, we have to try and guess what the game is. Easy. All right. It's it's a pretty easy game. Usually, well, lately actually, they've been getting them more often than not. Also, what is up with freaking casters on chairs? They always grab any wires near them and pull them underneath every single time. That's very true. Really very, annoying. Very true. Anyway. I'm a Got another mixed weird games for you. So right. today we're doing a PS2 game. Of course. Yeah, you know, it's, it's been a trend, hasn't it? <laughs> um, also, and this is less relevant than usual, but it is published by Atlas. <laughs> However, it's not an RPG. It's a 2D an, fighting game. An Atlas 2D fighting game. Yeah. And it is Japanese style. Mm -hmm. Anime sort of influence. I mean, it's sort of, you know, self-implied by the publisher. Um, developed by Examu Incorporated, formerly Yuki <laughs> Enterprise. Oh, this is this no, is shut up. A very I, just, I got, I just, I've got no leads right now. Okay, no leads at all. Nothing. I mean, like, what are the 2D fighting games we, I, I like. What year? I what of, year? The year is 2006 is when it first came out on the PS2. Come on, Ryan, you know fighting games. <laughs> There's a big Japanese detail fighting. to this I could drop when you're ready for it that would probably give it away if you're going to get it at all. Okay, like, the only, like, Soul Calibur's Tekken, like, I, that's it. That's all I know. I got nothing. Chad yeah. has it already. That's not Don't, surprising. Uh, all right, continue. I've got nothing. Yeah. All right. It's all girls. Oh, dead or alive? <laughs> this guy's oh, in dead or alive. Is it, uh, is it Rumble Roses? Wait, nope. Dead or Alive? Oh, yeah, Rose right is not 2D, I'm though. thinking of Extreme Beach Volleyball. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. I followed your train of thought there. The only, like, 2D fighting game with all girls I know was released recently. Skullgirls. Yeah, Skullgirls. It's all one I could think of. Yeah, this is an older one, man. I'm, I'm exempting myself in opening chain. Okay. It has uh, 121, yeah, that. Holy 121 shit. fighter combinations. You select from 11 maidens and 11 cards to create a fighter that suits your playstyle. You got me, Nick. I don't know. Let's see what chat's telling me. We, we bowed out then? Has no chance. I'll just tell you that straight up. No, because oh, I God. suck at fighter games, so like I... Rated T for teen, partial nudity, sexual themes, and violence. His next guess is Street Fighter 2 Turbo Edition. <laughs> Freaking top line on the back of the box. Humanity's last hope is one big cat fight. Oh, come on. No, now. I got nothing. No, I, I, like, if this is, if, if chat's got it, like, I've never would have guessed that. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm Here's tapping out. Nick Today got it. Arcana Heart. I have never oh seen that God. game in my life. <laughs> yep, that's, that's good stuff right there. Series is still going to this day. I believe they just released number three on Jesus. Steam fairly recently. I've it's never, not bad either. I've never seen that game <laughs> in my life. Arcana Heart, Arcana Heart 3 Love Max. Love Max. Oh, it's got a 9 out of 10 on Steam. Yeah, wow. it's a pretty good game. It's incredible. That seems like the kind of game where the people who play it would give it a 9 and a half out of 10. Which I don't mean right. impolitely. I mean, it's just... It, it seems They've like got their dedicated favorite. fan base. Yes. If you are into it, you're into it. Hey, Makes is this... Sense. Kate, are you here? Yeah. Have you ever heard of Arcana Heart? Yeah. There you go. Kate got oh. it. Kate's got a point. There you go. Blue W Monkey was our winner in chat today. So good job, Blue one. W that Monkey. Was next weird game today. Oh my god. Arcana Heart. Not oh. three love Kate Max. Kate might be very surprised at the amount points. of games that I have on my shelf that she would recognize that you wouldn't. CD? Yeah, he is a PlayStation 2 original. That might be expensive. You, you should think so? Nick to see it on eBay. He might make money off of it. There you go. There you go. Sell it, Nick. 
I'll look it up. Girl. I'm probably not gonna sell it though. Arcana but I'll Heart. I also love how so there's a sentence at the end of the Steam description. The girls are appearing on Steam for the first time in open square brackets, Arcana Heart 3, Love Max, six exclamation points. <laughs> Close bracket, two more exclamation points. <laughs> like, they had to put the title Very of the game extreme. in brackets because there's so many exclamation points, and they didn't want it to yeah. be confused with the exclamation points that in indicate their level of enthusiasm. That's funny. This doesn't look like it's going for much. I see a, a one bid on here is for 42, and there's a few that are, like, 19, so it's probably... The Love not. Max is all capitalized? That's hilarious. <laughs> I'd well, just good job, it. Nick. You've got a point. Yay, I win this week. Good job. <laughs> and that's going to wrap it up for this week's Roundtable Podcast Live, run by yours truly. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad of a shit show. We, we, we did pretty well. Nice we did all right. There's a few things I need, to, I need to nail down, but we did all right. Before we go, I want to thank our Patreon subscribers. Just kidding. I can't get into Bear's Patreon, so thank you, <laughs> Patreon subscribers. Uh, if you're new, you can go support us over at patreon.com slash roundtable. You can check us out on iTunes, Twitch. All of our Twitter, there's a subreddit you could talk to us at, Google Play soon, maybe. Uh, we'll post it on our channels. Basically, you can just find Roundtable almost everywhere, and uh, it's all right. You know, we did, we did a pretty good job. So thank you guys so much for watching. We'll be back next week, February 12th, same bad time, same bad channel. Maybe Malf will be here again uh, if he is bored and has nothing to do. I, I'll be available, I'll, you know. I, I appreciate I, that. Thanks, guys, so much, and we'll see you later. See you next Bye. time. Bye.